Hello everybody, welcome to Alberton Court uh, for the uh, May's Public Accountability Meeting. Um, I think we've got a few new faces around the room, so I think we'll do some introductions if that's all right. Uh, Tina, can we start with you? Hi, I'm Tina jones McGrath. I'm Acting Office Manager for the OPFCC. Thank you. I'm um, Simon Gallagher, I'm the Group Manager for Hambleton and Richmondshire. I'm Rebecca Steer, HR Advisor for North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue. I'm Maruta Carson, and I'm a HR advisor for North Watch Fire and Rescue Service. Tom Thorpe, uh, Policy and Scrutiny Manager for the PFCC. John Foster, Interim Deputy Chief Fire Officer. Jerry Mulligan, Police Fire and Crime Commissioner. Hello, I'm Lisa Winwood, Chief Constable of North Yorkshire Police. Hello, Kim Harrington, Assistant Chief Constable, and is responsible for local police. Will Naylor, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for North Yorkshire. Sharon Goodell, <coughs> Assistant Chief Executive for the OPCC. Richard Ogden, Temporary Chief Inspector, Temple Trust Day. Hello, Liam Connell, um, Head of Criminal Justice. Uh, Hi, I'm Matt Hagen, here on behalf of the Police Federation, but I'm also a Custody Inspector and a Deputy Police Inspector. Great, thank you, welcome everybody. Um, we have uh, apologies from Simon Dennis and from Andrew Brody. Um, if we can then now go please to the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, because this is live streamed, um, they are uh, just a list of links. Anybody got any comments? Nope. Okay, great. Thank you. Have we got any questions from the public? 
Not in advance. Not in advance. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, Rebecca, I think you're first up then, really. Okay. Um, so, Mindy and I are going to present um, our presentation on equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, our presentation is going to give a bit of a current overview of our workforce profile um, and some of the changes we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, we're going to have a look at some of the current EDI initiatives that we're running at the minute and also have a little bit of a look at the future as to where we'd like to be in the next 10 years. Um, so Mindy's going to introduce with the current workforce programme. Can we go to the first slide, please? Just keep it to the This first slide just shows the composition of our workforce. As you can see, the largest groups are our operational workforces, then followed by our enabling staff, control and volunteers. Can I just, just there's a little bit of jargon in there which is Green Book staff. Can you just um, explain what they are, please? Green Book staff is now our enabling services, so they are made up of HR, finance, payroll, okay. our administration staff. Great, right, thank you. Can I just say, just ask, just on that previous, how does that differ to other fire and rescue services? It's on a par with other fire and rescue services. Normally, the largest parts of the workforce are the operational workforce, then followed by the enabling services. Okay, but the split between on call and whole time. On call, we have the largest on call service in the um, UK. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, this next slide, um, there's three charts here which will show you the gender split that we've got across our workforce groups. Um, as you can see, with the support staff by gender, this is our enabling staff, they are more representative of the communities that we serve in terms of the gender split. Ideally, this is where we want our operational workforce to be. Currently, in terms of statistics nationally, we have a 5% representation within North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service for female firefighters. Nationally, the target is 5.7%. So when you say target, what do you mean by that? Um, previously, previous government asked us all to attain or get to a 5.7% representation of women in the fire service. Nationally, we have got to that. It's not representative of the communities that we serve as such, but it was something to attain to back then. When was back then? Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago was when the target was set. It was two, 2008 to 2018. So one would argue that that is entirely out of date. Yes. <laughs> this is where we're now working towards to be more representative of the yeah. actual communities that we're within. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Um, can well, I, oh, oh, go on. Don't go. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, go. Um, of that 5%, are they split across the operational yes. service or are they all in whole time? No, sorry. Um, that 5% is the whole of North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. However, if we split that down a little bit, um, our on call group is at 5% representation, our whole time group is at 3%, and our enabling services. Um, and control are more representative of where we want to be. They have more of a <coughs> split. In terms of control, they have a better female representation than male. Theirs has gone the other way. So I did visit one uh, station uh, where they thought they were, might be possibly the first ever all-female crew. So that's pretty much your 5% in one station. <laughs> um, but I just, do you, do you have a, what's your gender pay gap? We just fa just find out because yeah. it's just interesting, isn't it? That sixty five percent of the, the of the uh, 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 sort of support support stuff by gender are women, and I, I I would hazard a guess that that is in lower paid administrative jobs, and it would be interesting to understand how that relates to your gender pay gap as well. I think the, the gender pay gap though takes into account the, the number of our senior roles in in in, <coughs> in headquarters that are occupied by. Yeah, so that's that almost skews it rather than actually having <coughs> people right. where they are. So be, it'd be just under, uh, interesting to understand that that dynamic. 
because I think operationally we know that there's nobody above watch manager. <coughs> yeah, that's correct. There yeah, are temporary correct. people. Whereas no, there is. Uh, there's the, 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 control. the control station manager. Yeah. <coughs> I think there's a number of challenges as well. It's a number of challenges within the uh, operational side of things. When you look at our staffing profile um, at full time versus on call, it's similar numbers in both sides. We haven't recruited in in the whole time for ten years. We're about to do so, so we really do need to address that. But then again, on the on call side of things, we know that we've got work to do there to improve our agenda across both duty systems but particularly with the on-call is where we can be doing and should be doing. We have tried to address some gaps in terms of the on-call recruitment because that's been our continual recruitment process as such because we haven't recruited for full-time firefighters but that pool is very limited in terms of they have restrictions on themselves in terms of work, performing at response time to station as well as an incident. Yes but you're still only recruiting half your population aren't you in those areas because mm -hmm. um, it's nearly all men. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, there's a, a whole range of questions as to why women don't uh, uh, apply because th there's low numbers of, of, of women applying in the first instance, as well as then the attrition rates that go through the training uh, program and, and all the rest of it. Um, um, yeah, okay, all right. kind of a little bit of a background into where we are. Um, we've just previously mentioned about um, recruitment. So over the last 10 years, we know we've had little representation from the BME community as well. However, there has been an increase, although very small, within our service. About 10 years ago, we only had about three people from a minority background group. Today, we have 17. So although in terms of the sta stats of the whole organisation it comes out at 2%, we are trying to work towards being more representative, more representative of those communities that we have. So why do you think there's been an increase? We have done a lot more awareness um, with our local communities. Um, we've invited people to come and see what we actually do. We've tried to be more inclusive of what we're doing. It, but I think ultimately it comes down to what does an on call firefighter do? And it's getting that message out there. It's not just going out to fight fires anymore, there's community safety, there's a lot of aspects to it now. Okay, so, um, so but this, sorry, this 10, 10 years applies across the whole of the workforce though, doesn't it? Not just to on call. Yeah. And I suppose what I'm trying to understand is what thing, what what have you actually done in the past to try and improve the representation, to improve the diversity? I think previously when we did recruit, um, if I talk about operational, previously we did uh, positive action and things like that quite a lot of time ago. Um, but while we've had that kind of freeze in terms of full time concentrated on the on call, but also have raised awareness of our other support roles as well. And I think that's seen the increase of what we actually do as a fire service. One of the other things as well, Julie, that we've implemented over the last 10 years is we've introduced district watch manager roles, um, and their roles have been specifically engaging with members of the community and start to build up some of those relationships with community members and work with them um, around, you know, on-call recruitment that's been continued, but obviously while we've had the whole time recruitment freeze, we've been continuing to work with them throughout that time um, to raise awareness of the roles. And, um, yeah, I mean, you have the limited opportunity but then if you go back to your first slide which essentially said that on-call firefighters are 46% of your operational workforce and even though you've had a whole time uh, a freeze on whole time firefighters actually the pool you are recruiting from is the largest percentage of your uh, frontline staff so that would indicate that a lot obviously a lot more needs to be done and, and to be fair to, to North Yorkshire you're not alone in this it's not it's a it's a problem across the, largely across the country, isn't it? It is, uh, and uh, I'm sure some of the uh, the next few slides, which mm -hmm. we're coming on to, explains a little bit more yeah. about what we are doing now mm -hmm. and what we've done to to attract that to that increase that we have seen uh, over the last few years. Albeit it's not substantial, it's better than we were ten years.
um, our workforce strategy. Um, it's a new strategy that's been developed, and what we've tried to do throughout it is support um, the inclusive culture that we want to see coming through in terms of our recruitment, training, development, and also our approach in supporting staff as they're going through um, different aspects. Um, the main focus of the strategy is to develop our staff, and in terms of that, and it sounds, I am repeating myself, we do want to reflect the community. And in terms of the watch managers who are helping us support that, as well as our district crew managers, we feel that we're making some step where there. Okay, so um, one of the main questions there was obviously what are we doing to improve some of these um, figures of representation within the service? Um, so the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion group um, is a new group that's been set up. Um, and really what, we, what we're trying to do is put focus on three main areas. So that's understanding and improving how staff feel, um, organisationally implement, implementing best practice, and then also collaboration is a key focus. Um, and that's you know, some of the terms of references within that group um, that meet to identify areas that we need to improve um, and really put focus on some of these areas. An example of how we are um, responding to some of the underrepresentation across maybe some of our senior roles and middle manager and also supervisory roles within the service is a regional women's mentoring program so as we've identified nationally nationally we're representative compared to our other fire and rescue services so very um, similar figures wise so regionally um, with west humberside and south yorkshire we all recognized that we wanted to um, improve this and provide um, a programme that would support uh, women in service to have a uh, opportunity for a mentor programme so they could be paired up with um, someone who has the skills that they're looking to develop. Um, so we've, we've put together the programme and um, we'll hopefully provide this opportunity for um, female members of staff to come forward and say I'm wanting to develop my skills in this area and we can match them with mentors not only within North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service but also the other regional services that we are working with. Um, at the minute this is the trial that we're implementing um, and it's one that hopefully the outcomes of it will be rolled out nationally um, so we're, we're hoping to get positive results from, from this programme. So that's one of the ways in which we are responding um, to some of these things. I had um, the opportunity of sitting and uh, doing a, a conference uh, was it last week or the week before uh, in London and um, <coughs> the chief of Humberside was uh, the one of the other talkers at the conference, speakers at the conference, and um, he was talking about the work that they've done in Humberside, which sounded really... Um, uh, as if they were um, doing really well, mm -hmm. and I suppose the the other question is is really how can we learn? How do you forge those links with other services where they are making progress? So he was he was talking a lot about the the UNT for She program yeah. and the work that they're doing alongside with that. Um, so I'm just wondering how you develop how you read across to other services and bring that into North Yorkshire. Yeah. So there's um, a number of networks and um, ways in which we connect with other services. Um, so there's the NFCC working groups that we attend um, for equality, diversity, inclusion and for other groups as well. So for example, the on-call practitioners group um, where we meet regularly to talk about experiences that other services have had um, and to share best practice. So there's a, a really good open environment where we can you know, talk about things that we've experienced that we want to learn from other services and, and equally share experiences that we've had. Um, so through those groups, um, we start to build those relationships up to, to learn and share best practice. So one of the things that I've observed, uh, and which has been fed to back to me at a, a national level, of the national meetings that I go to, is that for the last few years, North Yorkshire has not really been very active in respect to sort of getting out and about and um, participating in national programmes and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I suppose what I'd be really interested in seeing is a bit of a step change in the way that North Yorkshire engages with the wider service, because I'd, I'd, I'd particularly because we've got relatively 
you know, we've not had a lot of external experience come into the service over the years, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, we a weakness of the, of the service. So it's trying to make sure that you've got a really outward focused, positive um, program to mm -hmm. try and sort of draw in external um, best practice um, and ideas. I think that's a, a, a fair point. Um, yeah, we <coughs> would uh, um, welcome the chance to be part of more of the national uh, national budget council groups on, on, on all aspects of the service, but this particularly. Um, and you're absolutely right on the uh, on the um, uh, lack of movement, shall we say, into the service. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Rebecca did come from West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue yeah. Service, uh, so here's a good example right. of where we've brought someone in with a wealth of experience behind you and now moving things in the right direction. Right. I think one way in which we can demonstrate that as well is previously, you know, for the last couple of years, we haven't had staff members attend the development weekend. Um, and this year we've got four staff members attending. So that was raised through the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion group that we recognise that we're not connecting as much as we want to as a service and actually putting focus back in into that. And we're supporting staff members attend and starting to build those relationships up there that we can, you know, learn again and share best practice. Um, there's a number of staff members, you know, that are really wanting to engage, which is yeah. a really good thing, you know, for us as a service, but for staff members to yeah. develop and, and move <coughs> forward with us as well. Yeah. Can I break on the mentoring programme? Have we yeah. got firefighters taking part in that then? Yeah, so what we had was um, sent out an expression of interest for staff members to be a, either a mentor or mentee, <coughs> and we've had representation come through, and at the minute, mentors are in the training stage, um, so they're going through the training, and then June at the development weekend is when that programme will be launched. Um, so then we'll start to pair up um, the mentors and mentees with the relevant skills that the mentees are looking for um, and start to... How many mentees <laughs> are interested? Um, we've had <coughs> about five staff members come forward and um, we've had a, a lot of staff members who are really interested in being mentors um, for the time scales of getting them on the programme at the minute we've only got two dates running but because of the demand that we've seen from staff members wanting to engage and support the programme we are going to be running another at the end of this year um, and, and respond to that, that interest. Um, it's, a, it's a really positive thing for us because as we've identified earlier we, we would like to see more representation in senior roles that we can you know mm. pair mentees with mm. um, but what the program allows us to do is if we've got a mentee who is looking for someone say for example at a group manager level or equivalent in within the enabling services um, part of the service then we can also go to our colleagues in other services regional contacts and say actually have you got a mentor that could support our staff member so hopefully if the trial is successful and this is rolled out nationally, that'll be a really positive thing, not only for the four fire and rescue services involved, but um, fire and rescue services nationally. Okay. I think it's fair to say as well, we do recognise, um, particularly within our middle, middle manager level, that uh, we really do need to do a lot more on our awareness of more current uh, diversity issues. And when we look at <coughs> the intersectionality conference we've got coming up, that's a good starting point. But in order to encourage participation in some of these initiatives that we've got running, we need you know, good representation at all levels to really promote and encourage people to become involved, and that's something we have recognised and we will address. Mm. Can I just offer <coughs> an update on the, um, the trousers? Women's trousers? Yes, um, so now there well, <coughs> a little bit of background probably. <laughs> the the, the question is, though, um, working with the rep bodies, um, there was a number of surveys completed with staff members around gender specific workwear um, and also the, um, if the <coughs> workwear was suitable and the range of options in terms of female fitting items of clothing. So a group was set up to discuss this and working with the rep bodies a number of surveys were completed and actually we didn't have, um, although we looked at it previously, there was a period of time where actually we needed to relook at it um, and that we needed to work with the supplies teams to make sure that we had the correct um, or options available for staff members. So now we have ordered and um, made sure that we've got a full size range and options available for staff members to make sure that they are comfortable um, in, in the workwear that they, they have. And getting any positive feedback? And yeah. yeah, so um, there's, there's some staff members that have trialled it and, mm -hmm. are, and are happy to you know go with the, the new fitting style of trousers and others that have tried it and said actually I prefer the old style so they're you know taking um, using that as going back to the, the old style and that's completely their, their choice as long as they're, they're comfortable with the uniform. Um, so yes. Great, thank you. So I'll move on to a little bit around best practice. So some of the things that we've done 
quite recently. Um, so reviewing our recruitment and uh, well, our recruitment processes, we've identified that actually there's an area that we could develop in terms of upskilling our staff members around unconscious bias and having a little look at the the recruitment process. So a number of things that we've changed recently, and this is you know in particular referenced to implementing best practice around recruitment processes, um, is we've implemented unconscious bias training, um, and we've also moved to blind sifting through recruitment. Um, this is something that was raised and identified, you know, that we actually we didn't have previously, and it's in terms of recruitment best practice, it's the way in which we should be moving forward around inclusivity and um, raising awareness of what unconscious bias is and how to identify it and making sure that our recruitment processes are fair. Um, so that's one thing we've implemented. We've mentioned around sharing best practice nationally um, in terms of how we connect with the groups and another area in terms of implementing best practice is the staff survey. So last year we ran our first staff survey um, for a long period of time, I think, John, you may be able to, I don't know if we've done one previously, have we, is that the first one? Again, it was a long time before yeah. uh, since we did the last one, so yeah. this has been a real um, learning curve for us again. Yeah. Uh, but the staff survey has been really informative, I'll, I'll yeah. you thunder on. Um, so, so what we did, we, we ran our staff survey and we obviously received all the, the results back, so they were published um, for staff members. Um, following that, we advised staff, man staff um, members and managers to have conversations with their teams and, and staff around what the results show and encourage staff members to take part um, and ran a number of workshops locally um, with staff members and then also ran a number of workshops where staff members could attend and start to talk about ideas for, for moving forward as to what was found. Um, so some of the areas, for example, that were identified as improvement areas. Um, well, we had 36 areas um, of improvement and 66 areas of strength were identified through that staff service. Obviously, there's quite a lot there that's kind of um, the staff members to take on, on board. So what we did was run the workshops to really kind of focus in on some of those areas to be able to respond to them and you know make some key changes in the uh, within the areas. Um, so one of the things that was identified was around the transparency of senior managers and the, the visits that were had. Um, previously, staff members would submit questions before the visits, but that's been completely yeah, notorious. It was yeah. notorious. Yeah. So, so that was you know some of the from the workshops and various things that we've run, and um, that was one of the things that we were finding that was having an impact. Um, so we said, okay, we're going to remove those and now. There's there's no questions that are set before. The environments are very open, where staff can you know challenge and have open conversations around things that they want to raise and make suggestions as how how things can be improved. Um, so that that's one thing that. Um, we've been introduced around this, the staff survey. We've got one more workshop to run, and then following the results of that, um, we will then be sending out some, some best practice and things that we've learnt. There's been some great ideas coming through from that. Um, one example, we went through to a station, didn't we? And it's you know little things in terms of awareness about our roles um, out to the public as well. So um, the terminology on call, a lot of there's a lot of misunderstanding around what the on-call firefighter role actually is. Um, so things through social media, like tweeting when crews are going out to incidents and putting on-call firefighters attending um, this event is really starting to help us explain what the role is, especially around recruitment and diverse, um, you know, attracting a diverse um, pool of staff members. Um, the community impact that this is is having and how we are engaging with the community can also be seen through some of the events that we're, we're planning in. Um, I'll go into a little bit more de detail in the next slide around recruitment strategies, but things like attending Pride events that, that we've got planned in for this year for York and Harrogate um, are some of the ways in which we're really starting to um, get back out and engage with the communities that we, we serve. So um, um, just a, a few things then on, yeah. uh, on this slide. So do you understand whether it be from local work or, or national, and, 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 I'm, and I'm genuinely, I'm, and what the barriers are for people joining the fire rescue service? Do you understand? So, 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 I, so for example, I've heard, you, you get lots of snippets coming back, mm -hmm. that um, during the training process that can be done yeah. to, um, to attract m m more women and BME um, candidates in the first instance, mm -hmm. and then in the way that you go about things, what you can do to support them once they do mm -hmm. express an interest. Yeah, um, so I suppose in terms of what I've learned so far from attending the, the national events is that yeah. there's no <coughs> right way 
that all, no one way that primary school services do recruitment. So all primary school services have slightly different kind of processes that they, they bring in. But there are key things that are recognised throughout each service in terms of you know the fitness programmes and various other things that are discussed where services say yes I've identified that as a barrier and more work's been done to, to looking into that. Um, one thing that at the last conference we found or learned from another service was that um, when completing the fitness test, depending on if you're wearing gloves, sometimes if they're not uh, properly fitted gloves, you can lose around 33% of strength on com when completing the test. So things like that we'll be aware of and then make sure that when candidates come into the process, they're making sure that they've got correct, you know, fitting um, kit to make sure that they're going, they've got the best opportunity when going through the, the process. Um, so there's things like that that we will pick up at the national um, events. So I suppose so. Th I suppose the question is because because uh, I mean, please, I mean y you've done some specific work, haven't you, around this, and have had some successes, yeah. and uh, you know when you, you get quite a lot of, I uh, have had <coughs> quite a lot of, sort of glib comments come back saying, oh well, you know North Yorkshire's only got five percent diversity and we're there anyway, and you know and, and 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 there's a lack of understanding around the importance of the issue in yeah. the first instance. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and to me, that's about legitimacy of, of the service that, that you provide, um, and then and then the actual physical, practical things that you can do to to not give people an advantage, but to create a level playing field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of that is is the awareness raising of it. Yeah. So being really open in terms of what the process entails and. Um, what candidates will have to go through when they go through each of the, the recruitment process stages. In particular, I'm making reference to the fitness testing, for example. If we make um, potential candidates and candidates aware that they're going to have to carry out this exercise when they come through the recruitment process, and this is how you can prepare, it's about giving that information initially and you know some of the positive action events that we'll be having. Exactly like you say, it's about getting to all candidates to the start line so that they can go through the process in exactly the same way, but providing that information in advance will allow them to prepare and you know be aware as to what's expected within the role and also the process that they, they have to go through. The district watch managers at the moment do carry that out with the on-call in the on-call recruitment process. Mm -hmm. They will go out to the station, meet with people, explain the process and try and put time scales in to say this you know we'll do the fitness test at this point and this is and they'll work them through where they need to where, where they maybe need to improve or what they will face when they come to that and they they, they put a lot of time into that to actually smooth out any issues in the recruitment process. We've introduced um, things like have a go days, so there was one at Summerbridge Fire Station a fortnight to go uh, on a week, run on a weekend, so people were welcomed into coming out with the like various uh, yeah. tests before they actually get to do it for real. Uh, so that raises awareness. We're very much keyed in with our regional colleagues as well, because um, Humberside in particular and South, uh, West Yorkshire have run um, positive action action campaigns in the, in the last uh, couple of years so there's a lot we can learn from them uh, and it's really important that we do so. Did um, you get the right people at your have a go day then? <laughs> That's always the challenge and we've advertised <coughs> as far and wide as we could do, we use social media and um, various different mechanisms. Um, you, you, you've got a catchment area which is fairly small um, and, and you know for all the effort you put into some of these days, sometimes it's getting people in the first place, and that's very you know, that can be a challenge itself. I mean, it, it's, the, the fitness element of it is really interesting. I mean, you know, I mean, I've you know put the BA equipment on and been into the smokehouse and tried to rescue <coughs> the dummies, and you know, the, you do need a lot of physical strength, and I think um, you know, it, 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 to to make people <coughs> aware of that. And I was talking to a female firefighter, and she was saying, well. I have to go to the gym every day, you know, I have to keep my fitness levels up. Mm -hmm. And people people sort of, you know, s y the, the requirement actually to be strong and fit is, is, is important. But equally, you've also got, you're going into vulnerable people's houses and you're providing people with self and well checks. So there's a, there's a richness to the role that people probably don't understand. They probably understand the physical nature of it more than they understand the other side of it. And I think uh, that's absolutely true in, in, in terms of why diversity is so important nowadays. You know, it's to reflect the communities which we serve. Society's changed very much, so, so therefore that is why we need to attract you know, people from diverse backgrounds to help us with the work that we undertake. And it's not all about the firefighting, it's about the, the broader community safety work as well. 
I'm so I'm absolutely right in exactly what we need to do. I think going back to the fitness test itself, uh, it's worth noting that that is actually a national standard which yeah. we have to apply to. Um, but there are many different ways we can coach people to get to, to the point of where they can pass it. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter whether you're 18 years or you're 60 years old, that is the standard you've got to achieve. And so therefore it does get harder as you, as you get older through the service. Just, and then on, on this slide, you've talked a lot. You've talked about um, recruitment and prom promotion processes. I mean, again, I had a, a female firefighter say to me that she felt um, that um, there wasn't an obvious promotion process. That um, that you had to sort of earn your stripes, if you like, um, before you'd even be considered for promotion. And so there's quite, I think you know, trying to really make that transparent and let people understand how they progress their careers is, is really is really important. And I'm you know, certainly from the conversations I've had on stations, I'm not sure that is as transparent as it could be. Uh, and then and then also on the on the flip side of that is when things do go wrong, is making sure that the processes around discipline and uh, the rest of it are, are are fit for purpose as well. So it's it's both it's it because if something goes wrong and that isn't dealt with effectively, then that has knock on and negative consequences as well. So it, it, it you know it's understanding the totality of it and making sure that it is as fit for purpose for inclusion and diversity mm -hmm. as it can be. And given that you've got such a small number of women and BME people in the service anyway, I do wonder how developed that is. So we've, we've just actually introduced a, uh, a standard operating procedure on, on which covers career paths, if you like, and that right. promotion route through. Um, and the next stage is then to develop that also, because that's for operational staff. We need to uh, do exactly the same yeah. for the enabling staff as well, so that there's a, a clear um, career path through there. I think just going back on the recruitment promotion process, they have been reviewed, um, and certainly the promotion process. The national framework document sets out that all senior roles will be advertised nationally. We've gone one step further than that, and we've said all roles will be now national, uh, nationally advertised. And so we're trying uh, our best in that respect to, to attract the best people into the service. That's good. And, I mean, Andrew Brody, the chief fire officer, was quite, was quite candid about it in his 100 day report yeah. about the culture. What's, what, uh, it, it, what percentage of people, not percentages, how well is the training going? How do, is, can you see the feel of culture changing to be more, not necessarily open to the idea because people generally are, but seeing the benefit of it and understanding mm -hmm. why you're doing it rather than just going through the motions? Mm. I personally say it's, it's definitely changing, but it's not, uh, you know, where we want to be. Definitely, um, I think that's going to take time, um, you know, within the cultures um, across all areas of the service. So there's definitely still work to do, and hopefully through some of these things that you know we're introducing, and through conversations with staff members, through the senior management visits, and and um, in our team especially as well, we've actually been you know going out and working at different stations, through stations through more visible and different workplaces to be able to have those conversations and with staff members to, to pick up on some of either those concerns or misunderstanding about you know what's in place and how to you know, respond to certain things. Um, so it's definitely changing, um, but it's you know a little bit more more to go. It, it tends to be the police had a lot of a um, misunderstanding of positive action <coughs> yeah. versus positive yeah. discrimination and people yeah. think they're being cherry picked for roles. Yes. Than Level playing field. Yeah. And I think that's that's true across many of our fire stations. Um, mm. You know, certainly when we're out there uh, making visits, we do get mm. uh, a misunderstanding of what, what this is about and why we're doing what we're doing and the benefits of it, mm. really. And people tend to think it's about changing standards. It's not mm. about that at all. It's about that's the standard, but let's attract the very best people in um, from all walks of life and backgrounds so that we, uh, we've we mm. got a, a good, diverse workforce um, in there. So the Rebecca's right, we recognise it's an awful lot of work to do. Um, we've got um, plans in place to to, uh, to address this, but uh, you know, we will continue with it. It's not something we, we're taking on. Mm. I think particularly with collaboration works, we've connected with um, our colleagues, obviously, within the, the police staff members as well, and so we've already started to say, you know, we're facing the same issues as, as yourselves in terms of mm. you know staff members understanding what positive action is and if we can work together on you know running workshops that staff can attend to you know have that information and um, develop their understanding and knowledge of it then that's an area of which we're trying to develop um, and collaborate. 
Thank you. So moving on um, a little bit to recruitment. So Mindy mentioned earlier around the workforce strategy. So our, our recruitment plan um, that we've introduced goes alongside the workforce strategy. So it runs up to 2021, um, covering a three year period. Um, basically, the, the yearly strategy has been put in place in addition to that, to really focus on what can be achieved year on year, because we recognise that you know things aren't going to change overnight, things are going to take a little bit of time, and we need to make sure that we're putting focus on the right areas of completing and attending the right events to be able to um, raise awareness within the roles within the service. So we create a yearly strategy as to what events we're going to engage in, what action we're going to take. Um, so that's, that's how we kind of put focus on what we're going to plan for the next year. The picture on the right is our district watch managers. So th the um, material that they're holding is some of the national branding that we've now changed to. Um, so this has been created following feedback from all fire rescue services saying that you know there's um, a lack of awareness of the role of a firefighter and particularly the on-call firefighter. Um, and there was services working in isolation, well not in isolation, working individually to create branding and, and duplicating work where we're all finding the same challenges, so why not work together and this branding was created for us to be able to use. Um, to where did that, did it come from the NFCC? It then? did, yes, yeah. I do, I, I, I do ha I find it a bit problematic actually, I have to say, um, because it, 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 it basically says you've got to be a sort of macho woman. And I'm, and I'm just like thinking, actually, you're trying to get away from that sort of macho image, and yet you show a picture of them. You know what I mean? I don't just find it so what, um, slightly uncomfortable. So how it was designed originally, so there's a couple of stories. So there's the On Call Fire website, and there was two stories of, of individuals created. Now, they are um, building a number of um, stories from staff members to explain, you know, different roles and who they are and lifestyles and, and that's going to it's been developed as well and um, so feedback from the initial initial branding you know that's how we feed it back into the NFCC group. Well I sit on the National Fire Sanders bus so I might be feeding it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. Just be interesting to understand what focus groups they've done around it and yeah. whether it's just from people within the service or whether they're actually it's from potential recruits yeah. you know who what's the profile of the person you're trying to recruit to I don't know yeah. it's just I don't know, it's just, just one interesting. Of the, um, one of the things, so the district watch managers, like Simon says, are doing a lot of work in the communities, and one of the things that we've found from it, that again, that we will feed back as well, is that you know, it doesn't say quite clearly recruiting um, on there. Yeah. So that's something that, you know, it's, that was being developed yeah. as well to make sure that it's clear exactly um, what the work is. The on-call awareness week, I'll just touch on that briefly though, because that was really successful for us. So during that week, um, nationally it was agreed that we would have an on-call awareness week where we would all use social media across all fire rescue services um, to really promote the role. And that was really successful for us. We did see an increase in, in applications um, during that, that stage. Um, so it's, it's just showing that you know engaging in those types of events that are happening nationally and, and us getting on board with having a um, positive impact for us. Can I ask a question? You mentioned a couple of times mm. um, watch management, well, which management en engaging the community to sort mm. of um, explore these opportunities, etc. Again, I'm only referring to the police because because it's something you've sort of been working through. But um, we struggle to do that actually sometimes, and and, it, and sometimes you need the right kind of person to go into community and really connect and yeah. and, um, uh, and explain the opportunities around the role, etc. How how do you go about targeting the groups that you're after recruiting? So whether it's women or the AME communities, etc. How do you go about doing that? Yeah. Sorry, really, really, with the, with the watch manager on call, um, we, are, we are restricted as well by the fact that we're recruiting for literally a mile or four minutes from the station, which causes some problems. But we too try to use the individuals that we try to use the, the, as the watch managers have usually got some local knowledge and they can then sort of look at the, we can sit down as a team, look at the local area, and if we're recruiting, say, in Reith, that's a different campaign to what we would use in North Allerton. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try and match it to where, where we're at at that time and we're sort of looking at the, the environment we're recruiting into. So in, say, Easingwall, there's a lot of new builds going up, so we're looking at hopefully young families who were uh, people who were just getting a, a mortgage, maybe thinking this is actually additional income, so it works quite nicely there. Whereas we know in Halls, it's more of a a community feel it's people uh, want to contribute to their community so it's it's judging it to the place that they're in and the watch managers are very good at doing that 
One of the um, other things that we'll do as well is I'll work with the district watch managers to make sure that if they are attending events and we can make sure that there's diverse representation of our staff members attending those events to have conversations with members of the community, then we'll, we'll try and do that. So we work together saying, you know, this event's coming up and it's just myself going down. If we've got any other staff member that can come with me to make sure we've got a diverse representation of staff actually attending to have those conversations with members of the public, we, we put consideration into that as well. <coughs> um, this slide show, it concentrates on the on-call status and levers that we've had for the past couple of years. As you can see, there's been quite a high turnover in terms of our on-call staff, which is slowly starting to balance out. Um, the on-call levers has been one of our biggest group, so we have tried to concentrate on the reasons why people are leaving the on-call service and what we can actually do to try and reduce that a little bit. Um, when we've looked at the leavers, we do offer exit interviews um, and we do offer these to all our leavers as well. But especially with the on-call leavers, uh, we've found that the other commitments they have have impacted on the commitment they can give to us. So. When I've looked at the actual leave reasons, the top ones there have been um, changed in primary employment, um, childcare responsibilities, and also self-employment responsibilities as well, where people have kind of had to go into the wider area and not work as close to the station as they would like, which has proved a challenge to us in terms of keeping people in the box. If you could get more on-call staff, though, then that might help even things out, might not it? Yes. Yeah. It would, uh, and, and you know, there's, we are a victim of our own success in many respects with this as well, because people join the service <coughs> because they enjoy going, you know, they want to go up and have action, go to incidents, and the incidents have fallen, and so it's a huge commitment uh, for them to be on call, you know, and that's the right thing. We want, we want zero calls, we want less calls, um, but of course. Um, when people are putting all that commitment to be on call uh, and not getting turned mm -hmm. out, then uh, you know the, the staff do lose interest over time. Um, we have uh, made adjustments, so we've extended um, turnout areas so that we went talking. Min mentioned there about certain people's lives, lifestyles change or work commitments change. So we will put um, flexibility in there where where possible uh, to accommodate those changes, even if it's just a short term. Um, to help some through so through a back because you know obviously it takes a lot of uh, time effort and um, investment in training these people and what we don't want to do is lose them mm -hmm. uh, just because their circumstances have changed. We've also looked at the availability structure as well. So in terms of some stations, they have kind of a shift system going on, which allows more flexibility exactly. in terms of tyres yeah. of work. Yeah. But then and you need, need more people, don't you? Yeah, we need yeah. more people to run yeah. it. So it it does have its pros and cons. Are your retention rates any better or worse with women or minorities than your? A lot better. better. A lot better. Yeah, we seem to retain a lot of our, a lot of our minority groups. Um, if I just concentrate on people where we've made reasonable adjustments, we do it a case by case basis to ensure that person can still actually do the job they want to do, mm -hmm. and that seems to have resolved a lot of the issues that people have stayed um, in terms of operational at the end of their careers or whenever another opportunity has come up and they've wanted to move on. I'm just uh, conscious of time. We haven't got many more slides to go, so you are doing pretty well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is our fault for asking all the questions. Um, and this last slide just looks at um, the policy procedures we have in place to support our staff, and also if a problem occurs and kind of the policy to go to. Um, the options that we have are available to all our staff across all work groups and are utilised by all groups also. Um, there's options for paid and unpaid leave, there's options <coughs> to take um, a career break to either develop oneself or to maybe um, do some further education and um, there's all sorts of um, different things there that we can look at. Just, um, so. just one, a, a sort of wider question I suppose is that obviously you've got in your on-call cohort of people, you've got obviously a lot of people with different primary employments, some of whom will have skills that are very relevant to the fire rescue service. Do you sort of 
know what skills you've got in that on-call cohort of people and how can that uh, help develop both the service and people's careers? I think there's room to develop that a little bit further in terms of we've started to put um, you know, a lot of focus on some of these areas. I think that's one of those areas that we could actually look at a little bit more. It's the same with specials, isn't it? Yeah. You, you, could, you know, similar because similar, they've got lots of specials <coughs> but they don't necessarily know what they all are. Yeah. So I don't think we've got a particular register with anything of that on. Generally, it comes down to local managers and knowing their people, yeah. and yeah. then in, including um, staff with an interest um, um, in particular areas. So, for example, if we've got someone who's keen on IT or is an IT professional working on a station where we've got people that are very well developed in IT, yeah. then that's where they can mm -hmm. help out. And certain, you know, there's a whole range of different skills out there where that does come in locally. Uh, I think it's um, a fair point that you know this is something we can do more across the service to include people. Okay. Um, also, I'd slightly inter in addition to that as well, if we do come across somebody who does need a reasonable adjustment and can't continue with their current role, we will try to redeploy a person as well into a suitable alternative. But that sometimes isn't always the case. So we do try our best to try and accommodate that where we can. Have you, have you got any issues around facilities? So, thinking showers, toilets, sanitary provision, yeah. all that kind of stuff. That we, we did, and we did a massive review, which was led by the then Corporate Equality Group about ten years ago. So we reviewed all the facilities we had on station and found that certain locations didn't have um, facilities for all our staff there. So we did put a massive program in place, and all stations have got facilities. Some locations have a shared facility, but they are secure, so they can be used by everybody. But ultimately, all stations have. When we go towards new builds, we look, do look at dedicated facilities there. I think it's fair to say um, that our estate is, uh, is in, a fair, uh, in, in a poor state of repair, and, much of it, uh, and we recognise that we do need to upgrade, but of course that costs money, and we've just taken some uh, re registered our capital programme to accommodate the uh, the savings we've got to make, so it's a um, you know it's still something we need to address. However, where we've put new builds in and where we have done refurbishments, we've made sure that everything is is up to speed on those stations. Things like prayer rooms and those sort of quiet places and those facilities. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to put those sort of facilities in place. However, with the new builds, there are rooms which we can use, so we made sure there are facilities there in case we do actually need them. If that makes sense. So as and when we would be able to put that in. So all, all um, fire stations with community rooms have all got the disabled facilities on there so that when we welcome the public in, we can welcome people in from you know, with disabilities and all sorts. Uh, but yeah, it, it's recognised, um, but of course, we've got to prioritise where our, our finances lie as well within this one. But certainly any, any refurbishments that we do, we certainly make sure that uh, all, all can I ask whether you've done a recent check for kind of sanitary bins and the like in all the different stations? Because we've had some feedback recently that there aren't necessarily. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of success with that in custody, yeah. actually, as a nice segue. Yeah. But, um, there is due to be a review of the actual facilities that we provide. And when the um, facilities pol policy came into place, sorry, I've swallowed marbles again. Um, when the policy came into place, a check was carried out and there were facilities available in our stations. Now, I think as time's moved on a little bit, then it's come to the review when you have a check. From um, conversations that I've had done with staff members as well, it's it's not just on on stations. It's it's on the you know welfare units, on the appliances as well. So when you know staff members are at incidents, we need to you know make sure, and that's raised through the EDI group and um, to discuss to you know work with staff members to see how we can make sure that there's the facilities or the right facilities there for them to be able to use in different situations. Um, final slide just around the, the future, so I'll, I'll keep it brief for our, our final one. So obviously we recognise that there's huge opportunity for us when we're collaborating um, with fire, um, police and also national fire rescue services as well. Um, so we're going to continue putting effort into making sure we collaborate and sharing best practice. We are wanting to have greater representation in middle and senior management roles. One of the ways in which we're hoping to achieve that is through the initiatives we're putting in place like the regional mentoring. Um, another area is an increase in interest, so as we move forward with the recruitment plan and, and strategy that we are um, increasing the awareness and interest from 
um, all members of the, the communities into the roles that we are advertising. And also um, continue to review our, um, our efforts that are putting into the initiatives, so making sure that we're doing that yearly as well as having a bit more of a longer term um, time scale for what we'd like to see. Great. And um, must see um, HMI CFRS may have something to say on all of this. Yeah. Um, so, which again is 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 uh, has come out in the inspections yeah. they've already already done. So, um, it, it's good to see that in the future you're taking this on prior to the inspection. So that's, the, that's I, the just. Perfect. I know we'll come on to monthly performance later. I wonder if you could include some of this kind of information in that yeah. in the future. So yeah. Yeah. Keep a sort of watch and brief on it rather than yeah. keep pulling yeah. it back to the house again. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Okay, anybody got anything else that'd like to add? No? Right, Leanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel a little bit like a thorn um, in the middle of two roses today because uh, <laughs> I'm flanked by custody experts. Um, oh, and, uh, <laughs> purely by coincidence because uh, Inspector Hagen is um, here in the Federation, rep um, but he is actually also my custody inspector over at uh, Harrogate, um, which is quite handy if we need to, if we need to uh, uh, tap into expertise and in relation to that. I'm sure um, much in that. Pardon? I'm sure much relishing that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, uh, my other uh, super expert um, <coughs> on my left is temporary chief inspector Richard Ogden, um, who is essentially going to be doing most of the talking today. Um, uh, <laughs> so we are really pleased to um, give you an overview um, of how uh, police custody today um, works in North Yorkshire, um, which um, which will cover uh, the estate um, and the. Uh, how we manage vulnerability through that estate, um, along with uh, the standards and expectations. We touched upon some of this at the last plan, but Richard will um, go into much sort of broader detail in relation to that. Um, we also want to um, touch upon uh, the voluntary uh, attendee process and how we've moved towards that um, uh, through the changing uh, landscape of, of criminal justice um, as an alternative uh, to uh, arrest. Uh, and explain the differences between those two and um, uh, we want to highlight some of the, um, uh, the, the good work that we've done in relation to uh, pre-charge bail um, which uh, we know um, has caused some challenges both nationally and in uh, North Yorkshire Police and we've spoken about this on many occasions Commissioner um, but um, we've got a lot of, uh, of good work in progress in relation to that. Um, and uh, then we're going to just finish off with a few um, statistical uh, comparisons between the number of arrests and, and uh, disposals of uh, certain uh, offence types. Okay, so um, without uh, further ado, I shall hand over to my uh, rose on my left hand side. All right, Leanne, can I just say we do also recognise that some of the questions that we asked are not necessarily custody questions and they yes. trip over into. Investigation hubs and all of those bits. So we do, yeah. yeah. On that note, we have <coughs> investigation hubs and, well, it doesn't have a title yet, but investigation hubs and crime kind of issues in a couple of months' time. So if there are any issues that we can't answer today, yep. we can carry those over yeah. to you next time. That'd be great. And it should be quite a good, helpful sort of precursor actually to that. Oh. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, thank you Leanne for that introduction. I've not been called a rose for a while. <laughs> thank you. Um, great opportunity <laughs> for us to be here today. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, and I think it's it's good for, for me who's particularly passionate about this, this area of business and have been working in it for a number of years to hopefully uh, give you some information and overview to yourselves and the public about what we do in custody and how we deliver both custody and an introduction to voluntary attendance as well as Leanne's alluded to. Um, I've had the privilege of working in custody as a custody sergeant a number of years ago. Um, I think that's still been in good stead for the role that I'm doing now and I'm privileged to be, to be leading the team uh, and a really good team of people that try and keep uh, custody ticking along and keep everybody safe which is our, our main objective as well as obviously dealing with some highly sensitive issues and bringing uh, offenders to justice as well. And also directing people that perhaps have made a, a mistake um, away from the criminal justice system and supporting them as well. So it's a real balance of how we balance the needs of the victim, the needs of the suspects, and making sure we do everything right. 
So, um, what we can do in custody and what we do on a daily basis, we make a difference. And I think that's the biggest thing that we try and get across to our teams. We make a difference to everybody that comes into custody, hopefully in a positive way. Not everybody that comes into custody is guilty of an offence. It's reasonable suspicion to be arrested. So we have to bear that in mind. And not everybody that comes into custody is somebody that's going to necessarily go down the, the legal avenue. So if you're able to just put the next one. This slide here um, is an overview of North Yorkshire. You'll all be familiar with it. Um, just to give you an idea on the symbols, um, where there's gates, they're actually the bars with the red squares around and they're bars. There are the custody suites are. And the other picture, though it's difficult to maybe see from a distance, is somebody facing somebody in an interview for, uh, format. So we've got three custody suites, um, centralised custody suites in North Yorkshire, managed centrally by criminal justice. We have a central centralised team. Um, and I'm based in York, and I, I have a manager, custody manager in each of those custody suites. Custody inspector Matt's obviously here with us today from Harrogate. There are a number of voluntary attendance suites, and we'll come on to voluntary attendance shortly, um, and they've increased dramatically in the last few years, um, trying to keep offices in local areas where appropriate, where they can manage investigations locally, where suspects do not need to be arrested, and we'll come back to, come back to that shortly. So we've got the three, three custody suites, total of 57 cells, not loads across this force, but sufficient. Um, and as I say, we try to deal with people away from the custody environment where possible. So can I just ask, just so it just just to compare, so how many cells do they have? Uh, uh, Ellen, uh, uh, Ellen Road in Leeds. They're forty approximately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's so just one custody suite. Absolutely. And at uh, Middlesbrough, they have fifty cell complex. Yeah. But uh, so we have the geography, yeah. which is the difficulty, and we've got to have facilities in. Um, in accessible locations and obviously that's been one of the biggest challenges as a state over, over the years in, in a force the size of ours. But yeah, we have relatively small suites. York being our, uh, the most cells with 24, uh, Harrogate's got 16 and Scarborough's got 17 cells. Um, this has been a reduction from six suites back in 2014. Um, the operational policing model led to the closure of uh, Selby and Skipton. And then we also saw uh, a trial closure of North Allerton took place in September 2016, uh, and we did not reopen North Allerton as a, as a result of that closure. So that reduced us to the, to the three estates, and that's given us some challenges, naturally. Um, it's an operational decision that's, you know, it's a big decision to make, and it's something that's happened across the country with a reduction in custody facilities and court facilities. Um, and as a result of that, that's what's gone on and led to things like invest voluntary attendance suites being open so we don't have to deal with everybody at Harrogate, York mm. and Scarborough. So, so Richard, I think though it would be fair to say that um, Skipton and Selby and North Allerton, perhaps less so North Allerton, mm. were very old, dated custody facilities. Absolutely. Which had a whole load of risks associated with them. Yeah, big challenges to keep them to home office standards was, yeah. was a, 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 an ongoing task all the time. Now Harrogate, for example, is a flagship custody suite, opened in 2012. York and Scarborough, older estate, but have been renovated a number of times in recent years and are certainly to home office standards. Uh, you're right, Skipton and Selby um, used to give me concerns managing it centrally, but actually were, were we able to still provide a safe environment for people to be taken? Notwithstanding, it was very um, accessible to officers that worked in those areas, but we've got to first and foremost, as I said earlier, make sure people are safe and make sure we can staff those custody suites appropriately, which was always a, a challenge with those I mean, smaller I, suites. I, I still think that amongst the public there is a view that you can just sort of chuck someone in the cells to dry off overnight or whatever it is, and that it just does not happen. It, do, it does not happen, and hopefully yeah. I'll come onto a slide that talks about some of the risks. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a team of detention officers as well as, as, well as police officers yeah. that look after people because that is our primary role. Then I think the public naturally are concerned when they see deaths happen in police custody, and hopefully I can reassure people here and, and, and anybody watching at home that um, that isn't the case. Um, we, obviously things do happen um, and we, you know, we don't be com mustn't be complacent but custody is a safer place now than it's ever been. And from a, from a business perspective custody suites cost millions of pounds yeah. mm -hmm. to actually you know, maintain and open um, so um, the consolidation has been has made very good financial sense as well as uh, safety sense. Mm -hmm. Just on that, finish up on that slide. So at the top of the county, you can see we've got VA facilities at Whitby, Stokesley and Richmond. Um, additionally, we've got them here at uh, Alberton Court. Um, and then to the west, we've got the one at Skipton. 
I'm hopeful to introduce one at Settle very soon, which will be further west. Um, and we've got them at Harrogate, York, two at York in fact, one at the north side, one at the south side, one at Selby, which will soon move across to the new facilities over there. And then we've got one at Moulton and one at Scarborough. We will consider opening one, as I said, at Settle and also at Tadcaster and potentially at Ripon when we sort the facilities out at Ripon eventually. But that's good to hear because the, the west side of the county does look much more bare than the rest of it. Yeah. The difficulty is we can put the facilities absolutely everywhere, but they do need managing, they all need equipment, they all need certain rooms, um, and they all need, there's a lot of, there's a lot to these VRMs. So what I'm comfortable is, it, with is if we do get that little gap filled in, um, the officers are having to travel great distances to get to these VA suites and they've been so well received and um, we've done a lot in this force with VA over the last few years and uh, I'm really quite proud of, of the journey we've come on with VA. I think I've been underestimated there, Richard, which has been a lead on the VA and they've put an awful lot of work in, into um, ensuring that we are where we are um, and that's sort of ongoing, so it's been really good work on it. Um, I mentioned before we operate a centralised custody model and three suites. Um, one thing I ought to mention is that um, obviously with the estate being slightly less um, and officers having to travel some distances to some of these suites when they've got people under arrest, um, that's a challenge particularly in this part of the county and certainly north of here. So what we did, uh, we saw an opportunity to work with surrounding forces and we've worked with Lancashire, Cleveland and Durham, um, particularly Cleveland and Durham, um, to uh, put in place an agreement that uh, in exceptional cases um, we will take people who need to go to over the border to, uh, to Darlington or to Middlesbrough the opportunity to go there. It has to be authorised, it has to be exceptional and the default location is Harrogate still. And as we'll come on to later that has been particularly useful when we've had one of the challenges around drink drive arrests uh, and some concerns around that and we've now utilised that facility and that option quite significantly. So does drink drive count as exceptional then, Rich, or is it? It just didn't initially. Driving? No, it didn't initially. It was an, it was initially bought in for vulnerability. Um, so particularly if officers were on their own, or there was a, um, and needed to travel a great distance, mm -hmm. or the, the suspect more likely was very vulnerable, and we didn't want to transport them a great distance, we could take them to a nearer suite. Um, on the agreement of the control room inspector and on the agreement of the force that we're accepting, um, and it wasn't initially for drink drive. As time has progressed. We've had some of the feedback has been actually we've lost a few cases or we've officers suggested we might have lost a few cases. I don't think actually there's a great deal of evidence to say we have, but I think naturally people are concerned when people are travelling for, for further in, in force to get somewhere. Now what we do is if people are, um, are providing a sample at the side of the road and it's it's over the limit but it's not high over the limit, they're the ones actually that we're more interested about rather than the person that's blown considerably over who will still be blowing considerably over when they get to, the, to, to Harrogate. The ones that we've got to be careful of are the borderline arrests that we do not want people to, to think it's okay to drink and drive in, in Hamilton or any, and anywhere else. From the public's point of view, you get stopped and you take a breathalyzer test on the side of the road if you blow over, you need to get taken to custody to have it done again, which is a formal evidence. That's version. absolutely right. So there's that gap where by the time you get to custody, you may blow under, and that's that's the risk mm. you're trying Yeah, to there is. It's an evidential road. Well. Oh. You can blow higher as well. You yeah, can, and that, does happen, that, that, that yeah. absolutely does happen as well. Um, and you, you're absolutely right, Will. It, there's a, there's a, an evidential sample needed at the police station. Things will change in time um, where the evidential roadside breath testing will we're come in, but it's taking a long time. Hmm? We absolutely are. It's taking a long time. Um, but fingers crossed, it will, when it comes in, it'll be it'll be great. We'll we're, 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 not holding, we're not holding <laughs> our breath on that, Richard. I mean, I mean, so through the National Rural Crime Network, we are engaging on that issue. But 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 the the forensics market is challenging us. You all, you know, uh, yeah, that's not happening. That's coming in the time soon. Um, right. Just down there, you're okay. So as it says in there, police custody is staffed by police custody sergeants and civilian detention officers with a, custo with a custody manager responsible for each suite. Um, centralised custody is seen as good practice by the HMRC FRS, which is a Majesty's Inspector of the Constabulary of Fire and Rescue Service. They hold us to account, they come down out to see us and we're one of the only departments that have unannounced inspections, which is always something we have to be mindful of. They're more than welcome to come in and see us at any point, but then they'll come in for two weeks. 
unannounced to see at, sit in our custody suites and speak to staff, not only in custody, but, but people that use our services, um, to make sure we're complying with the, the correct standards and expectations. Um, that's quite intense because they, they, they will come in almost like SWAT teams and in unannounced at sort of you know five or six people at the same time and it's too weak and, one, and they really go into significant detail. Absolutely um, and we last had an inspection in 2015 they, they operate on a five five six year uh, cycle that's not to say they wouldn't come in at any point. Um, so professionalism is paramount. We deal with a, high, a wide range of individuals uh, and, and partner agencies. Uh, many individuals, as you can imagine, with chaotic lifestyles uh, and complex needs and vulnerabilities. Uh, as I said earlier, it's important that we keep people safe. Um, and we must be attentive to those people who are probably least safe in society. So I think that's something that we need to be very much mindful of. We, we're governed by <coughs> uh, rules and regulations, as you'd expect, legislation under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act plus the external scrutiny of, of standards and expectations from the HMIC, FRS, and also the Independent Office of Police Contact. Um, and also, we're, in, we're also um, visited regularly by our independent custody visitors, um, and that's a scheme that's, uh, that's managed by, by Tina um, over here in the room. And independent custody visitors come and see us at least once a week, if not twice a week. They're, in, they're, they're volunteers that come into custody to make sure that we're looking after people to the standards that would be expected. They speak with suspects, they speak with custody staff, and they bring to attention, our attention, anything that concerns them. And I think we have a really good working relationship with the independent custody visitors, and um, that backs up the good work that we do, fair to say. We have CCTV throughout the suites now. Every cell has CCTV. CCTV cameras are absolutely everywhere. Um, so that is additional scrutiny, um, and that's fine. That's welcome. That also supports the good work that we do in custody at any at any one at any one time. Um, we also do our own internal inspections occasionally. And what I'm also pleased to, to tell people here is that we've done some peer reviews as well. We did a recent one with Durham. It was a really good opportunity to get into a surrounding force and see how they operate their custody and they visited us likewise and did the same and we learned a lot from that because um, we're very brutal with each other at times, uh, we're very complimentary of some of the things we see and we're also um, point out issues that we, that we want to raise and I think that's a, a, a good, a good uh, relationship we've got with Durham and we've also got a good relationship with Cleveland who I've been to see recently and we'll continue to do that and expand on that because I think peer reviews are, the, are here to stay and are a, a good way forward. I know it's not directly related, but it's sort of related. Um, appropriate adults. Yeah. How is access to appropriate adults? Access to appropriate adults has always been a challenge. There's two sides to this. Obviously, there's the appropriate adults for young people. Um, there's the legal requirement that anybody that's under 18 must have an appropriate adult. And we have um, uh, a good relationship with, the, with our partners in the Youth Justice Service and the Youth Offending Teams. Um, they will provide people during the daytime and volunteers into the evening, up to like 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then we use the emergency duty team to support us through the rest of the night. We don't interview too many children during the night, you'd be glad to hear, but we do have children, um, and obviously 16, 17 year olds in particular, that may come into custody overnight, and we make sure that we comply with the legal requirements. An appropriate adult can be anybody that is deemed appropriate, and it could be a family member or it could be a, a, a member of a particular, a professional member of a scheme. The challenge is the vulnerable adults, where it's not a statutory responsibility to provide appropriate adults, and that has been a challenge for forces up and down the country for years. We've made some good progress on this recently. There's a lot of work still to do, though. Um, when you say good progress, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, with the City of York Council particularly, where we had, um, we had, a, we had um, some challenges, and we've worked closely with the City of York Council um, and uh, myself uh, uh, and Will, um, and we've met with representatives there. And we've now got a scheme set up for daytime cover in the City of York. Um, and I, I'm really pleased that we've got a rotor ongoing now, and they've prov they're providing coverage for anybody arrested in the York area uh, during office hours. And then out of hours, we still rely on the emergency duty team at this time, um, which can, can lead to some, some challenges. Um, North Yorkshire County Council will also come out during the day and provide ad adults for vulnerable adults. Um, and I think things have moved on, we've progressed very well, but there's still a lot of work to do around this to make sure that we're absolutely satisfied that those people <coughs> that are in most need can get access to an appropriate adult 
24 hours a day. So Matt, when I when I, I last, I don't know whether I'm sure it was you that I discussed it with, or certainly somebody in Harrogate saying that there was less of an issue in Harrogate because you've got some local volunteers that that you could call and they would cut, 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 come in. Is that true, or is that? In my experience, we have never had a problem finding an appropriate adult for Harrogate. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'd say I think a couple of years ago, Richard, I don't know if you disagree with this, but um, the service for vulnerable adults just simply wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. North Yorkshire County Council for us then made progress quite quickly. They did a sort of internal review and made some changes to their their internal scheme, which is sort of undertaken by staff, um, quite quickly, and that that proved quite fruitful quite quickly. It was much harder to make progress with the City of York Council, um, and. The discussions with them were difficult, and I think it wasn't the priority for them that it was for us, um, to put it short, but that has changed recently. Um, Rich is a much better place to say how well the scheme's gone recently. It's taken a long time to get that scheme in place, as far as Rich would be concerned, I think. Um, I've met their new head of adult services, and I'm using her again in short order. Um, uh, but we thought we would let them see how it goes, really, and yeah. if it improves enough, great. If it doesn't, we'll have further conversation. The real challenge is those there's four or five times that it's really difficult to get someone, mm -hmm. but they're the ones that are also hardest for any other programme to get, be it vol another volunteer mm -hmm. service, that another, you know, so Northumbria have a university student-led service, but Attention they even struggle at that kind of time as well. So the ones that are really difficult to get are just really difficult to get, come what may really, but. What we have got is a really good cohort of appropriate adults at York now. There's about 20, 25 of them that have been for training. Um, they've been on familiarisation visits around the station with me. Um, and we engage with monthly meeting with them and uh, we've done some training uh, from police and also from uh, solicitors about how the role works and uh, really positive. I think now they want to get out there and, and do the role. And so I like, think like on the whole firefighters, you, they also yeah, they, they exactly want to use the their skills now and, mm -hmm. and so we need to make sure we've got the yeah. right number. We don't want to bombard them with requests but at the same time we don't want to, we've got to use, use the skills. There's a lot of enthusiasm now which we don't want to lose, very much like what you said earlier. Um, so hopefully that reassures you, but there's lots of work to do, um, and there is, although it's not going to be legislated for some time around, around appropriate adults for vulnerable adults, there's an expectation that local authorities will be held to account by, 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 the, by the Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner's Office, uh, which I'll share the document with you um, about that. Okay, next one, fine, thank you. So we've, we've touched on a little bit about the, the challenges in, in custody. <coughs> um, as I said, I think it's safer, certainly when, 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 I, when I was working in custody, and, and we kept it as safe <coughs> as we could. And, and this is a, a regional contract that we're in with somebody called Leeds Community Health NHS Trust. Um, and we've been working with them for a few years now, but now we're working, rather than working with four individual contracts across the Yorkshire and Humber region, we're now on one regional contract. And yeah, there's been challenges along the way with healthcare since uh, I came to the criminal justice team um, some years ago. Um, and I used to spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the service was, was, was doing what it said on the tin. And now, it almost is, nearly all the time. And I think uh, our rotors are full, uh, uh, the, the, the speed that people get seen in custody uh, is far quicker than you get seen in a hospital environment. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be in police custody um, for some people. Um, Don't tell A&E that, they'll be divided people to it. Um, it's safe to say, yeah, yeah. Richard really manages that contract from an operational perspective on a daily basis in his previous role really closely. And I think partially down to that, uh, we have the best performance in the region in relation to the, um, the contract, um, and that's the Yorkshire and Humber region. Um, it's, it's not cheap, <laughs> um, but we are getting yeah, uh, the prices of it as well, didn't so, they? So there's a, there's a human benefit to that for the um, people you've got in custody. Is and there for, the, and for the staff as well. The, for the reassurance. Is there massively. an operational sort of justice outcome at the end? Is there any? D does it improve speed up into? You know, I don't. I don't know. Is there any? Well, it can do. It, it certainly doesn't. It, does, it helps because a lot of the, the requirement there is, is, is forensic provision as well. It's taking samples, yeah. Yeah. which in the past has always been a challenge um, with getting doctors and, and and healthcare professionals to come out to take to take samples and do fitness for interview examinations and requests. So having somebody on site, yeah, absolutely speeds up the process. 
gives that reassurance to custody staff and there have been a number of examples over the last few years where had we not had a healthcare professional on site I do seriously think that we could have had some, ser some, serious, some serious issues um, where you can't always get an ambulance there very quickly um, and actually it's been really reassuring to have those people in the custody suite have become a real integral part of the team so uh, yeah that, that's massive it is expensive but it is it is worth every penny. It, it is, it is worth it, yeah. I mean, um, clearly in terms of the outcomes as well, um, which Richard will come on to, um, which will link in and work closely with some of our healthcare providers, um, will be the liaison and diversion, which will help with that recidivism, hopefully in terms of that um, early pathway um, Absolutely. Uh, approach. It's um, an exciting which period. Which this will help. Uh, um, it links into the healthcare, but yeah. Yeah, it's an exciting period with the liaison and diversion service. That's coming in um, as we speak, really. You're probably going to see it on the ground mid-July. Um, but we're working very closely with um, T's Esquire Valley um, NHS Trust, who've been successful in, in tendering for the liaison and diversion service. This is uh, overseen by NHS England. This is not a police-led initiative. Um, but NHS England will oversee that. And this will mean we'll have people in the custody suites and eventually going out to voluntary attendance suites in the courts as well. Um, and providing another another layer of service and support for those people that, that deemed to need some additional support and direction in their lives. So they will see people in custody, and they won't get involved in the forensic side of, of, of things, but they'll see people um, and screen them and give onwards care and support. And we're really quite excited by this, um, and hopefully um, you know, it will, it will come into fruition from, from the summer and, uh, and it'll be well well. It'll, 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 it'll be welcome, so. <coughs> um, we've got on there uh, referral pathways, very briefly on that. Uh, I think it was discussed, as Leanne said at the previous meeting, uh, a bit on referral pathways. It'll link in with the liaison and diversion service. As I said, not everybody needs to go to court that comes to see us, and even those that do go to court still have referral pathways to other uh, support mechanisms as well. So we have a number of referral pathways out there that we can send people to, depending on their individual needs, um, whether it be drugs, alcohol, uh, women's diversion schemes, uh, support schemes for um, veterans from, from uh, HM forces, etc, etc. There's a number of pathways out there and they're growing all the time. Um, every detained person is subject to a risk assessment. Uh, it talks about care plans and observation levels on there. We, we, we very take our time when we're booking people in to make sure we get an understanding, particularly of those that are not known to us, about their needs because they're going to be with us um, for potentially 24 hours or even longer on occasions. And it's important that we look after them and we refer them to the embedded healthcare should, should, we, should we require that. Um, we look after people, we visit them in the, in the cells at least every half an hour if they're young people or vulnerable adults and at least hourly in all other occasions. And in fact, um, there are times when we have to stick with somebody permanently which can cause great challenges to, 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 the, to our team to make sure that we're actually we're, we're looking after those people with a face-to-face -face inter intervention uh, to prevent them from potentially harming themselves. Um, deaths in and after police custody, uh, touched on earlier that I, I believe custody is a safer place than ever. Um, the statistics are sometimes misinterpreted here and every death that happens in custody or, or after custody is a tragedy. Um, and you know something that we need to investigate and find and learn from any mistakes that are made um, as, as, we, as, as we move forward. But in terms of the safety, um, there was something like 23 deaths in police custody uh, last last year. The the uh, not I North Yorkshire. Not in North Yorkshire. No, across the country. Uh, we've not had a, a, a formal death in custody since 2011 in police custody. Um, there was 23, but that, when it says a death in police custody, that includes from, from the moment somebody's under arrest, not necessarily a death that actually happened in a police custody suite. So of those 23, only eight of them actually happened in a police custody suite where people were taken ill. For various reasons, people die in police custody. And as I said, each, of one, each and every one of them is a tragedy and something we should learn from. But if we think of the number of detentions that have happened over the course of the country, although they produce na nationally, we're still talking 700,000 detentions a year uh, and eight in police custody. Now, I'm certainly not going to sit here and champion that because eight people dying is, is certainly something to be concerned about. But I want to reassure people that actually because of the kind of things we've got in place, um, people are safer than ever, but notwithstanding, they're very difficult to manage still, where somebody's come in and taken a drugs overdose, um, and you may not be aware of it, and you've got to act very quickly. So even with everything in place, there will always be the potential for somebody to have a, a serious incident in custody. And hopefully that just gives you some idea of the challenges we're up against, because although 
prisoner or detainee numbers have reduced, the challenges remain. Uh, we've taken out of custody people that probably didn't need to be there, um, people that have now been dealt with by other means. And that leaves us with the people that get arrested are often those that are the most vulnerable and the most challenging for us. Um, and as I just alluded to, it's, it's also after they leave custody. We're very strong on pre-release risk assessments. We can't just send somebody out the door after 24 hours, 36 hours and think they'll be absolutely fine. We've got to make sure we put mechanisms in place to make sure they are supported when they leave. Whether that means um, them going with somebody or being taken back home or uh, uh, an ongoing support, uh, G GP, uh, uh, referral or they have something with further contact with liaison and diversion it's really important that we put things in place to protect people when they've left us as well who could, could be a particularly vulnerable point in their lives <coughs> yeah um, what a just final thing what I'll say is also when we're, we're being safer we've reduced dramatically the number of people detained for mental health reasons um, not just this force but across the country I think the legislation changes have assisted that the places of safety we've got across the county the um, dwindling places are dwindling safety. which is a real concern it an is. absolute concern when all the positive work to get them in place yeah. in the first place and now they are dwindling and that's the worry that we have but the legislation has changed in the interim which means we can't just bring people into police custody rightly so um, but some of those people were were a highest risk patients and now they're not coming in very rarely do we bring anybody into custody now who's detained under section 136 because it's such a high threshold we do find some people though who clearly when they get to us have got mental health issues and we will refer them into the places of safety wherever we can and get them out of police custody as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. So arrest or voluntary attendance, the slide's fairly self-explanatory if you can see that about the differences between the two. Um, they're both different ways of, of dealing with, with, with investigations. There are a number of reasons why you'd wish to arrest somebody. Um, and there may be a number of evidential reasons that you'd need to do that as, as, as well. Um, it's a big thing to take somebody's liberty. Um, we're, not, we're very mindful of that. Um, and the custody staff make sure that when somebody is arrested, it's, it, it's in, it complies with the, the, the legislation. And we do challenge, and occasionally we, we, d we refuse detention, and it can be dealt with by other means. But I'm pleased to say that the vast, vast majority of cases, officers are making the right decisions out on area, and they are arresting the right people. Um, and they're dealing with people via voluntary attendance where appropriate as well. Um, so quite self-explanatory there about what we do. Um, as I said, there's various reasons why arrest may be necessary. I'm not going to go through all those now, but a lot of them are around evidence recovery searches and also an ability to put conditions onto people um, to protect victims and witnesses, which is something you can't do on the voluntary attendance pathway, although there's always other means of protecting victims and witnesses. Voluntary attendance can be used for all offences. Um, but it's important that officers make that decision in line with supervision to make sure they're arresting the right people, the, the voluntary attendance of the right people and arrest of the right people. Um, there were concerns that I had particularly when we reduced custody estate that we might see a massive increase in voluntary attendance um, with people that would have originally been arrested. There's no evidence to suggest that and I think officers are on area making the right decisions. There'll always be those that could have been voluntary attendance and were arrested and vice versa. There'll always be some of those cases, but I think I'm reassured, particularly when Skipton and Selby closed, that we weren't seeing a massive increase in people that should have been arrested. We have seen in Hamilton and Richmond though. Seen what, an increase in voluntary? Yeah, yeah. So well, that's gone up by 109% compared to an, an average increase of 35%. Is that, is, that bearing, is that looking at the all three suites, the Richmond, the North Allet and the Stokes? The stats that yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll come on to those stats, will we? Yeah, that's fine, we can talk about that too, because there could be a number of good reasons. There's a number of reasons why voluntary attendance has increased, not just throughout the state, because there's been an acceptance of voluntary attendance, and it's an understanding it was something that wasn't really used a few years ago, and now it is, but it's interesting, far from it, it's an interview under caution still, um, and, it's, uh, and it's all done as per the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. As it says on there, risk assessment's conducted as well, because just because somebody's not under arrest, they're still particularly potentially vulnerable um, after they leave the police station. And we do deal with people for a variety of offences for voluntary attendance, so we have to be fully aware of that, which is why we introduced training courses in 2015, and people who are booking in voluntary attendees out in the area have been on a training course. It's only a couple of days, but it gives them a full insight into what we would expect them to deal with and the legislation and how they manage it, because we've got to get it right and make sure we get it right with VA training. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. 
Yeah, our rational numbers there, just a stat really, just to show you, I touched on before, about 700,000 in 2017-18. I don't have the figures for 2018-19 for England and Wales, but I do have it for North Yorkshire. Um, and in North Yorkshire, it went back up to 12224. So we have been feeling this in custody in North Yorkshire, that although it's been dropping over the years, and it has significantly, we've reached that level, as Leanne touched on a minute ago, we've, we've reached the plateau, and we've seen a, a, a gradual increase back. I think that's in line with the increase in crime that we've seen across the country. Um, but we certainly there's a, there's a drop there's been a drop a huge drop in arrest numbers o over the years, um, twenty four percent decrease over that time period, um, and that's based on England and Wales. It's based on all forces apart from Lancashire for some reason who didn't provide their uh, their data. So if you add Lancashire to that as well, that gives you the gives you the total. Can, can I ask them? Yeah. Uh, it's about twelve that twelve and a bit thousand. For the twelve thousand two hundred. Uh, well, that's primary arrests. I think it could be wrong about this. There were thirty odd thousand crimes. In North Yorkshire, <coughs> you have to bear in mind that each arrest will be a primary arrest as well. Um, so there could be somebody arrested for ten offences. Will only count as one under those figures because it's primary arrest for the coming. My, my only question mm. is so that which is so it's about forty percent of the, the yeah. number of arrests versus yeah. crimes. Uh, are we comfortable with that figure? Does that feel about right? Over the years, bear in mind VAs aren't included in that. They're not included in that, no. no um, uh, so, uh, and the next slide does does a comparison between VA and, and the rest. But over the years, there have been um, a number of changes in relation to our after court disposals um, landscape, um, uh, where people can be dealt with in, in many different ways, um, which hasn't always been the case from the, the period of the, of the of the monitoring there. So, um, so there are multiple factors in relation to that. Um, uh, and actually what we're seeing is a lot of earlier intervention and positive intervention in some of those lower area um, uh, offence sort of ranges um, um, and, so, and, so, and so we have to bear that in mind as well um, so I, I think this, this I think we're relatively comfortable with that I think this is probably similar to a trend across the country um, but, uh, but yeah um, it's something that, uh, that we're looking at closely and that the outport disposal landscape is probably going to change again um, uh, going forward but uh, yeah I mean the rest have gone down for, uh, for various reasons I and mean, we touched on voluntary attendance that doesn't necessarily uh, marry up exactly the, the increase in VA compared to the rest in, uh, the decrease in arrests but mental health we just touched on you know, there was 400 and something detentions a few years ago uh, for section 136 mm -hmm. in this county yeah. and there's now there's virtually zero so that counts and things they add those things in more focus and challenge on the arrest necessity so um so richard do, do you think i mean the question that the public will be asking is do you think the reduction in police officer numbers is a factor is a factor i.e there are less cops out in communities to arrest people i don't think so I, I, mm. think, I think we're getting smarter at who needs to be in custody right. and who doesn't, mm. and, and, yeah. have, uh, you know, and that assessment, um, rather than just uh, you know, arrest everybody and bring them through. There's a rise file there. Well, no, so is that, <laughs> is that uh, you're being smarter because you have to be, so you've got less resources, you're being smarter because it was the right thing to do. I think a mixture so of things. So bail, police, the, the police service themselves didn't, we'll come on to bail in a minute, yeah. Yeah. that wasn't something that that the police did, that the, home, the yeah. law was yeah. changed that forced that option. So yeah. it's being smarter and a nice way to say we have no choice but to do things differently or are you going, do you know what, this is, this is just the right thing to do. Right. We were arresting too many people, we weren't doing and, this and in the right and way. And Bale didn't stop us arresting people, Bale just stopped, stopped us blaming people. So we can still arrest, still arrest, yeah, still, <laughs> still, 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 still arrest, yeah. still arrest people but we just deal with them in a different way when they live <coughs> in the police station. So I think there's all sorts of reasons why that might be. <laughs> Absolutely, we you know we have been taking down a particular route as well, but I do think there's also been more provision of more an awareness of what other pathways are available. Um, there's certainly been a lot of more commission services, for example, where we're we're trying to have that earlier um, intervention as well. So, it, it, as with all things, it's it's never one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so and the, the broader change is is around the changes to, to pace in terms of powers of arrest that were a number of years ago in terms of that necessity piece. Yeah. And, and historically, uh, across the country, if you for, for every ten thousand crimes you might have, you would probably not investigate somewhere in the region of sixty to sixty-five percent of those crimes upon initial report because there is no obvious and, 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 and viable line of inquiry. So, for us to be making twelve thousand arrests against thirty thousand crimes and being in that sort of thirty-five to forty percent place is probably comparable nationally. Some force areas might have higher levels because they may be better resourced in terms of a 
cop on every street corner at a particular moment, but those are those are few, 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 few and farther in between. I think so. I think it's it's a broader piece than the the the, 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 like the custody area to crimes occurring and and of arrests that take place. And we also have the thing that bumps us up is we get a lot more information historically now in terms of forensic information that will bring us to make arrests at a later date. And, so, and that's where you get your, your as, as, as it's described, sort of the primary arrest with maybe six or seven offences. Yes. You, if you catch a burglar at four, for you know, doing a number of a number of rural burglaries, very often you're picking that up on intelligence basis yeah. and the forensics backs that up and you're arresting them for six or seven or eight or to ten farms or whatever. So the, the, there's, there's a difference in the profile that, that, that comes as a consequence of that. Yeah. And I think this is where the overlap is in the portfolio that we're talking about. So to answer your question, Julia, I think the better measure of that for the public is when we get calls for service and, and generally it's about there's somebody on scene or there's somebody running away from scene. Do we have somebody to send out to make the arrest? And are we making less arrests? At point of report because there isn't anybody to send would be a good measure of we've got fewer people and therefore can't get to the jobs and I anecdotally I don't think there are many jobs where we get an on-scene suspect where we can't send an officer in off the option. And the, the other you can't answer this question but the other example of that is picking burglary out from thin air that in the different types of crime that's happening our resources being put towards sexual offences or burglary or something else and now there's no one answer to that question but are we arresting less people around a particular crime type because we're putting that in less effort or time or resources into a particular crime type against another one? But that's where the public have a question mark. I think. Yeah, and then that would come from a dip sample of yes, sure. filed crimes or if there's a name suspect. <coughs> Generally, they're not filed unless somebody's arrested them, VA them, conducted the inquiries around them. Okay, so um, this, this shows the comparisons in yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Not, not necessarily, not necessarily yeah. to see. Ten yeah, no problem. So VA has increased in usage, um, 38% increase over the last uh, four years, um, for various reasons, as I've touched on before. Um, but that gives you an idea across the different different force areas about how how they've how they've increased. Um, let's go into that one. Uh, in terms of the, inf the concern raised, maybe about the investigation lens using the VA process or the arrest process um, shouldn't make uh, any, any difference. It is one of the challenges for us to make sure that people dealt with um, under bail, under, uh, under, under investigation or voluntary attendance um, are all dealt with uh, at the same time scales. That is a challenge and we'll touch on that on the bail slide in a minute about things we've put in place to make sure that can happen. Um, but, but if you're dealt with as a VA or under arrest, there's no reason why you can't still get the same court date and be dealt with in the same time scales, and that's something that's really important to reassure the public with. Um. Yeah, does, we, it, does, we, just sorry, very quick. Yeah. Does VA help keep the investigation locally managed? So we've got investigation hubs that yeah. are attached to custody suites, but yeah. if you can keep your victim and offender and investigation <coughs> in yeah. Skipton, absolutely. Come back to yeah, and you still link in with those investigation hubs <coughs> as, as required, but if you, it's. It's saving the officers having to obviously travel great distances. It's saving the victim uh, and the suspect, potentially, particularly the suspect here in this case, having to travel great distances. Um, and the challenges they've got to get to some of these cent more central places. So, yeah, it keeps the officers uh, more local, which has got to be a good thing at the end of the day. What it also gives is it, it sort of slightly reorders the process where you might have had offence, arrest, partial interview, release on bail, gather your evidence, bring them back. What we have now with the, with the law, I say, lower impact crimes, which might not necessarily hit the necessity test for arrest. Mm -hmm. An officer will have contact with the offender and the victim, gather their evidence, do one interview, which covers the whole lot. So actually, it can have a it can have a tendency to slightly speed up the whole of the process if we're going to use an out of court disposal or similar, rather than have this endless sort of yep. you know to and fro and, and somebody's got to drive to all these different places. So there's there's something about it smoothing the path a little bit. When Lower, I say low, lower impact offending, um, where we don't necessarily have that threshold, uh, which is good practice, I think, because then if we don't get to the point of a criminal justice result or outcome, we're not elongating the process for the offender or the victim for that matter, so that they get they get surety of what's happening and slightly the least. So, and with the increase in voluntary attendance as well, um, obviously there's some administrative work for custody to do around those anyway, especially if there's a postal charge to be sent out. Yeah. Is there capacity within the custody suites to manage 
support of that increase in, in workers. Yeah, so we've taken out the 3,000 or so voluntary attendees that come through the force. That they would have gone through custody suites before because that's where all voluntary attendance interviews took place, which wasn't right. And nationally, there's been a move to get people, voluntary attendees out of custody because we've not, we've, not, we've not taken their liberty away. So we've progressed this, obviously, with the number of VA suites we've got across the force. Other forces are really catching up in many cases. Yeah. Um, and there is an administrative function. One of the challenges has been that if you get dealt with out on area and you get to a stage where you're ready to, to finish the investigation, you would have to initially have put a, a file into a prosecution team, be an administrative process, to then get seen by somebody to make a decision. We identify that and we put in the postal charge option, which means local supervisors can make a decision and then we get custody to create the disposal because it can, this is where it can go wrong sometimes where people that aren't used to setting up court disposals might make mistakes, don't always know the right court to send them to, gap and gap courts, which are guilty anticipated plea, non-guilty anticipated plea. And so custody do a little administrative facility there. Now they would have been doing a lot on VA before, so we can't just say over to you, everybody, custody would have wash your hands of all this. We've got to take some ownership uh, and they are a gatekeeper to make sure that the administrative facility is done right and making sure we do things like biometrics, the captured things like that. So they, they put the charge on, on the computer, and then the prosecution team pick it up next day and send out the paperwork uh, to the to the suspect, and it works very well. And, 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 it, and it is one of those areas, I think, that's been recognised as really good practice because other forces haven't adopted that, and they have, as a result, through their CJ teams, quite significant backlogs in their postal requisition type uh, arena. So we've, we've, we've bypassed that um, and assisted. There's still the stuff that goes into the prosecution team um, as a result, but actually we're getting them into court and we're getting the charging date there and we're, we're getting that right. Um, and so that's something that um, uh, is really good. Uh, and we've had to do that, extend that for people under investigation as well, because these people weren't obliged to come back to the police station to answer bail. So suddenly we have this big gap of people that would have normally come back to have their charges. So it means that people can be dealt with by post. That's not to say that everybody's dealt with by post and we look at the vulnerable cases and if there's somebody that actually we think shouldn't receive that through the post, we'll do it by personal service. And we do so in about 15% of cases. Um, I'm conscious of time and this, I could do a whole we could do a whole discussion on bail, so we'll try and also stop through it. Um, pre-charge bail um, can be used pre and post charge as it says on the screen there. Um, and the Police and Crime Act included a significant reform, so it was, it was bought in for the right reasons but a lot of apprehension around police forces when it was bought in, um, which have come to fruition really. Um, some suspects have been on bail for particularly lengthy periods, two, three, four years, um, to then face no charges. And it's a long time to be on police bail. The difficulty, with, so we bought in pre-charge bail. Um, forces were already working to try and reduce that number and working very, very well. But unfortunately, the legislation came in um, and we've, complied with it, a lot of work went into it, complied with it, and now scrutinised very carefully with bail. We've got certain time scales where um, 28 days initially for an inspector, and then a superintendent can extend that for up to three months, and then it goes to a court. And we have a lot of occasions where we have to send people to, uh, cases to court to get that authority to rebail, and in about 97, 98% of cases, the court support that bail, which means we're doing things right. So we're getting bail right. The biggest challenge that we said is what about all those people that aren't on bail that are released under investigation? And then you suddenly have the worry that those people are left for two or three years without any time scales, without any understanding of when they're going to answer their bail. And that has been our biggest challenge. Um, and we got to a stage where nearly three, over 3,000 people at Christmas last year were released under investigation and they were, on, they were pending. We've, re we've put a lot of work in place to reduce that. We're now still at about 2,300, but we've got a bail uh, release under investigation coordinator in place now uh, to have some oversight. Just just started, really. Yeah, yeah so quite new in the process. Yeah. Right, so, yeah, and we're bringing in the suspect management policy, working with crime, working with crime very closely to make sure that you know we don't leave the release under investigation, the voluntary attendance ones, just to slowly move along, while the bail ones suddenly are all dealt with. You know. Fantastically. So, got to be they, done all together. Have they been moving more slowly then? Hmm? Is, is I think they probably have, yeah, absolutely. Because obviously, we've got all this focus on bail um, and the time scales that release under investigation is, is maybe not had that as, as, as like a, a, a formal prioritisation. Yeah, so yeah, it's, 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 it's human nature, isn't it? If you've got a bail, you've got a date there to work to. So, we're looking at putting in a ghost sort of RUI type system um, to, to manage the 
to manage that so people will have you know that date there and also the coordinator will so we shifted the problem focus. really well there's an unintended consequence from the home office well, but it was something that we always identified this is yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. absolutely yeah. Um, you know we've done a lot of work on this and we're not alone all forces are struggling with leasing and investigation but it, we need to make sure that supervisory oversight is in place and personal responsibility from officers to make sure that however they deal with their investigation they manage their suspects accordingly it can be very very difficult for people because they they, they, they really feel that they're sort of in no man's land mm. yeah they do. it can be really difficult for people but the legislation does say that we should still keep suspects yeah. updated and we've got work to do on that to make yeah. sure we're good at, very good at keeping victims updated we've also got to keep suspects updated as well because as i said earlier not everybody is is going to be guilty of a crime and the people have, have a right to know what's happening um, so massive reduction in the use of pre charge bail when it came in um, around 32% in 2016-17 of cases were bailed first time across the country and that dropped to 4% overnight. Um, uh, in our force we're comfortable with where we are, we're down about 13-14% of people are bailed. Um, we, did, we did go as low as about 7% at one point. I think we've got it right, I think we're in the spirit of the legislation. I think we're applying bail to protect people, to safeguard people where appropriate. Um, so on that, on that note, really. Of course. Um, that you've got a super complaint as your last bullet point, but there is one pending, it's not been accepted yet, from the people who speak on behalf of domestic abuse victims and survivors that bail have not used enough in their cases to keep them safe as victims. Is that the Centre of Women's Justice one? Yeah. Yeah, and actually I've, I've, I've had a look at that report and they raise a lot of the, of, of the questions that people would naturally raise across, across the, the, the country um, around the bail act changes, um, it highlights some of the concerns. I think we must make, uh, make it clear that we're, 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 quite so we're quite comfortable with the fact that we are applying bail where appropriate. There will be occasions where pe victims suspect expected to be bailed, and we haven't done it um, for whatever reason. But whenever anyone's released under investigation at the police custody suite, they are given notice and explained to them that although they might not be under any conditions, there's still an expectation that they will not interfere with the process, they will not interfere with victims or witnesses. There are standard loan offences of witness intimidation, harassment, obstruct police, and they are substantive offences and we haven't seen a natural increase in those across the country which means to say for me that actually we're probably doing it somewhere about right so those forces that aren't bailing people you'd expect them to be going out and arresting people for witness intimidation but there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that's ne necessarily happening uh, no cop obviously but i'm told witness intimidation is extremely hard to sort of get a it might just get a prosecution, but it isn't hard to necessarily get an arrest in the first place, and then that will bring you back in, and then you go for your bail conditions. So th there's there's ways around it. Um, it's not just someone's released under investigation. It's not that we turn a blind eye. It's just that they're not under specific bail conditions. Um, but they have a they have a value. The bail conditions, ab absolutely. And, and we will have. We do also have the um, uh, you know some dedicated domestic abuse officers that that will undertake victim safety plans. Um, dash risk assessments as well, which will feed into a whole load of other processes. Um, that, um, so it's not just this on its own, there's a whole lot of other safeguarding. Uh, the super complaint system you referred to, well, it's something that was relatively new to me, I mean, it only came out in November last year. Um, and this is um, complaints that can be made by organisations, basically, um, on behalf um, on behalf of, of, of victims out there in general. So you touched on one for the um, women's justice there. There's one on modern slavery as well that's out there at the minute. And uh, they're important that we, we keep a, a watching brief on those. Okay. Ruth, sorry, um, just quickly. You mentioned that you've had some stats around um, the number of percentage bail for uh, sexual offences and violence compared to the kind of average. I think there's been some difficulty in finding those. There is. Can and we follow up on that? Yeah, we by all means. I think all I can say to reassure you, is that, and we've had some information through from Superintendent Harder today, is that safeguarding is, is paramount mm -hmm. with everything we do. And a, a num the majority of people that are on bail are for domestic related offences, sexual offences, where we, where we need to protect the, the, the victim. So we can try and find those. I would, I would expect there's quite a high proportion of sexual offences that are on bail conditions. Um, ideally, we don't have to go to bail conditions because if we do, we gather the evidence in the first place or while they're in custody, we can go to charge them and then they'll be on court bail conditions. This is all pre-charge that we're talking about. Just to give you an idea of numbers. If we run out of time. Yeah, we are, and then we shortchange the fire service and then I get into trouble, so. Okay, well then there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few, there's a couple of things I'll, I'll try and whittle through and do stop me if, 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 it's, if it's gone on, if, it's, if it goes too far No, it's over. interesting. If um, the, yeah. the, as you can see there, since bail came in, um, obviously the first two blocks were before the legislation changed. 
and how the change has, has now seen that the bale dropped considerably, that's just in North Yorkshire, so down to just over a thousand there, or t uh, 10, 10 to 12 percent. We've seen a slight increase back and that's replicated nationally where forces really dropped it off to start with, some as low as one percent, and then have brought it back up. Um, and the use of RUI. Um, so you can see, you can see how, 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 it's, how it's happened across that, that slide. Um, a couple of slides uh, on drink drive, we touched on it earlier, so I don't know, need to necessarily go into too, too much detail, but you can see in, in terms of drink drive in there, that's the force wide arrest. Um, the numbers down the left um, give an indication, so they'll have dropped um, for the first three years there, not significantly, but they've just seen a, a bit of a rise actually in 2018-19. The drug drive had seen a massive increase, I think the, the legislative changes as well, a new offence of Section 5A that came in in 2016, and the proactive work that's taken place by our roads policing teams in relation to, to drug driving with the, uh, the, ro the roadside tasks that they've got, it's seen, a, it's seen an actual increase in drug driving arrests. Um, the roadside evidential kits we've talked about, so I won't come back into that. Um, yeah. Now this is interesting. Okay. So on yep. the left you've got drink driving arrest by yep. uh, Safe neighbor command. And, yeah. and on the right you've got drug driving. You've got you've got two differences in gap in gaps there. So mm. Har Scarborough and Rydale has 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 got um, the difference between Scarborough and Rydale and York for drink drive is re uh, drink drive arrest is relatively tight. But it's a massive gap for drugs. Mm. Yeah, and there's various reasons probably why this is. I mean, the, it's exacerbated a little bit on these graphs because obviously, there's year on year, the graph, the the, the, the bar will look a lot yeah. worse than it, than the, the lot stand out a lot more because if, if, if they already each yeah. year they have it. I can't give you a, a definitive answer as to why there's more drug driver arrests on the east coast. A lot of it could be that population dynamics. Yeah, I know, but I know, but your change. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I mean, obviously, it's got, we know there's a issue with drugs in Scarborough, don't we? But, mm. but the population of York is greater and there is still an issue with drugs in York. So the, the, it, it, there is a question here. I think it needs yeah. further research. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. it's, it's, a road, it's, yeah. it's yeah. something that the road's policing. Fewer people driving under the influence of drugs in York because of being a... a smaller city. Well, the wrong drugs in Scarborough, <laughs> they might be going from Scarborough to Whitby and... There's yeah, a much, a, it's a much bigger area. I mean, it's, a much, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a huge area, Scarborough Rydale, obviously, yeah. uh, compared to yeah. the city of York. We've got to bear that in mind as well. Um, and more opportunity to, to, to and, and more, to drive. more roads yeah. policing officers out yeah. potentially uh, on, on the arterial routes, A64, etc., than perhaps yeah. in, in, in the centre, the ones that have got the road, the Draeger kits and the uh, drug wipes. But it's interesting, and maybe a bit of research, yeah. and it's maybe for roads policing to come back and tell us more about about that potentially. I also think the, the dynamic in York and the millions of visitors that come from a night time economy now, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more drink culture. Yeah. It, it would be really interesting yeah, to see. Interesting. And that gives you a bit of an idea, because we're on the drink driving theme, it gives you the percentage of positive charge for drink driving. Now the vast majority of cases will result in a charge here for these offences. We're not looking at out of court disposals. If you're over the limit, you're going to be going to court. Um, so there's been some consistencies across there, but there's also a couple of things uh, that, may, that may jump out. I mean, how about on Richmond, going back to that one from earlier, the concern I had when I saw this was mm -hmm. the, the drop off in positive charges 2017-18. Mm -hmm. Haven't included 2018-19, because a lot of cases are still pending, okay? Um, but what I will say is that this doesn't include those that arrests that have gone north of the border, and although there's not huge amounts, there was something like 20 went to Durham, or 21 or so in 2017-18, of which, 18 were positive. Um, so even though I said it was more the borderline case that go over there, nearly all of them that went over the border ended up with a positive disposal. So that would naturally increase that list, that that, uh, that number uh, by some as well. So the, 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 the thing that's sticking out to me is it looks like the more rural you are, the less likely you are to have a positive charge for drink driving. Well, it doesn't. That's why I, I, I've just alluded to the fact that in, in, in Hamilton and Richmondshire there, they have got that option in place. So we've seen that challenge. I mean, we made the decisions. We made the decisions to um, reduce the custody suites, um, and, and and that's an operational decision. And there's always going to give us a challenge of people that are further away from a custody suite, and that's why the evidential roadside breath testing will be will be supported. It's, it's actually but I know the graph. It's like 15, 20 percent, isn't it? Which is quite a lot. But, if I, but when I went back to the Durham one a minute ago, 80, I think it's 82% of those arrests that went to Durham were positive charges. 
with yeah. 75 to play with. That that's, that's, that's higher yeah, sure. than any of those. But, but, that, but there won't be that many of them, granted. Is that reflecting no. Craven and, and Harrogate? Mm. I don't know. And they're both yeah. down. Yeah. So, so, so I, I do think this bears further scrutiny. to Because to we always knew that this was one of the risks, mm. didn't we? And actually, I mean, the early days, there were some real issues, weren't there? Um, I, I, there's a lot of work has been done to try and sort of overcome those issues, but this, this, these charts would suggest that those issues still still exist. I, I, I genuinely, I don't want to be flippant about it, but I genuinely don't think evidential roadside tests are are imminent. Um, and certainly, the information that we've had back from central government is that they are not, um, and that is because the for end, the people who, who provide the kits, there's nowhere else in. Europe that has the same evidential standards as the UK, therefore there isn't a market for creating an evidential roadside test mm. just for the UK. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a mechanism in the market that isn't working because the equipment isn't getting developed. So I, the, I, I genuinely think that that is a, 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 an issue. So, I, you know, I, and I don't know whether, I, I, for example, whether there's, a, there's an opportunity to have the evidential kits, not necessarily in a custody suite, but in another building. It is you know difficult. What I mean? it's, been like that. And it's been considered, I'll happily, happily can discuss this uh, as well in, 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 in further detail, but it has been considered, but it's, it, it then becomes very difficult around the arrest procedures, um, yes. because if you're bugging under arrest in order to be required to be arrested, so. yeah. Right. yeah, so it does, it does throw, it throws, <laughs> it throws, it throws up all sorts of other, other challenges around, around that. Um, we can certainly do some more research around yeah. around some of these patterns, yeah. so we can understand that in a bit more detail. Yeah. And actually, you know, is there is there is there would that lead you to greater to a conclusion that actually you should be using Durham and Cleveland more than you are? You know what I mean? Like, do you use Lancashire? Lancashire? Lancashire is available. Very rarely needed to use Lancashire. It is available at, Lanca at Lancaster. Lancaster custody. Well, it depends where in Craven they are. Yeah. I mean, if these arrests are at Bentham, then absolutely there's got an argument for that. If, but the majority of arrests in Craven are Skipton, and you can get to Harrogate very quickly, to be honest with you, you know, or the whole, unless that road's closed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, what, we will, what we will need to do is, is do some manual um, uh, research. You'd have to go and have a look at each case in detail around to be able to um, understand that in terms of numbers, and we, we weren't able to do that. No, today, that's, but, that's uh, right. but yeah, yeah. But, but it may well be, as you yeah. say, that actually, um, you know, we could be utilising Durham Cleveland more in, in some of those areas, and that's something that we want. One of the things we do do at custody, and I actively encourage it, is triaging those people that arrive yeah. and making sure that if we've got a drink driver coming in or a drug driver, particularly drink drivers, where they, it's absolutely adamant that we get that evidential sample quickly, is that they get put forward in the queue. The same can be said for young people, vulnerable people. We try and triage. Uh, and the same with officers that need to get back to area, we try and triage, but it's about having that understanding to speed things up. Because even if we have close custody suites, if there's four or five people queuing, it could still take as long as it would do to travel to all the way to Harrogate from someone from Richmond than it would to have two or three people arrested at the same time in York. There's so many anomalies with these with these figures, unfortunately. Okay, I'm going to finish on. Do you want to carry on or do you want to finish? I can finish if you want. Oh, there's only two slides, or I can yeah. go at that. Next, carry on. Sorry, I've got a question about Bedford. Okay. Right. Um, be quick because we are shortchanging. Yeah, no. no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, this is yeah, just a, this this stat just shows you for the last three years. Again, I didn't include 2018-19 because um, a number of investigations are naturally still under investigation or on bail. That shows the um, numbers of charges have dropped. Uh, that will probably be in line with the arrest figures that dropped as well. So there's nothing particularly startling um, by by that stat. But we have seen quite a number of. Uh, out of court disposals, which is OOCD. Um, they're fairly static, um, and the NFA rate stayed pretty much the same as well. If, so over that period, about 40% of cases that come into custody are charged to court. 24% um, were dealt with by an out of court disposal, and 30% were no further action. And there could be no further action for so many reasons. Um, so that shouldn't be a negative necessarily. Um, not everybody <coughs> that comes into custody under arrest is going to get, get charged. But just because 40% of cases were charged to court, those other 30% out of court disposals are an alternative and it takes people away who don't need to be in the criminal justice system, particularly first time entrants who can be dealt with out of custody and rehabilitated to stop them having that cycle of re and reduce reoffending and coming back into custody. Now it won't work for everybody and if they come back again we'll look at alternative means. It's interesting that's not gone up actually, you think with things like VAs going up so much that would be a more likely outcome of 
those kinds of processes. But I'm also comfortable that actually with VAs, that a lot of them still go to court. And I think that was the concern by some people who, who, who were saying, well, if you've got a VA, that's a soft option for victims. It's not a soft option. You, you've actually still got the same, a lot of people now charge the court with VAs as well. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of an overview, granted. Um, and then, I know there was some idea of just to pick on certain types of offences. This has been quite difficult, Tom, as, as you alluded to. It's been quite difficult to pick on particular offences. Um, so we've, we've gone for burglary because we've managed to get the performance team to give us some data on this. Um, the stat on the left there, um, it's the arrests on the bottom charts to show the arrests have been fairly consistent over the period and then the, the, the crimes are the, are, the ones, are the ones near the top which has dropped off with burglary and then, and then crept, crept back up again. One thing to bear in mind on the chart on the left is um, there could be an individual, as, as was mentioned earlier, that could be in for a number of offences, a number of burglaries. Um, but they only count as they only count as one arrest on that, even though they've been arrested for ten offences. It's primary arrest. This is, um, and the chart on the right shows the percentage of burglary offences, and this is uh, a mixture of burglary offences. It won't just be domestic burglary; it could be commercial burglary as well, um, and it shows the implications potentially of, of of the RUI and the bail. The the column the RUI and the bail uh, obviously increases as you go along because there's a lot of people in 2018-19 that are still released under investigation or on bail. So what we'd expect to see is both the NFA column, no further action that is, and the charge column to increase in the purple box as those investigations from RUI and bail marry out. Um, because a lot of the investigations are obviously still ongoing. So I think you'd see them come up to similar levels as they've been the last couple of years. There's a worrying trend though, isn't there? Yeah, and, th and that is consistent with the PAM that we had on burglary and all of the rest of it. So, th and it is a consistent concern around a, a focus on burglary. I wonder if we're running out of time today. Mm -hmm. uh, the next um, monthly part of the uh, the repetitive part of the meeting next time that we go through the key stats, because we'll, we'll do that in a minute, we have 10 minutes set aside within that to talk about yeah. burglary, because we'll no doubt talk about it in the that in half an hour or so. So it's, it's difficult because we can't really account for the, the investigations like no, 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 said no, no, earlier. No, 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 you're um, just presenting it. I, yeah. I, get, I completely get yeah. that. So yeah. I mean, that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of custody. Yeah. Um, I know it went on a little bit. Apologies for that. But hopefully that's given you a lot of information. Hopefully some reassurance as to what we're doing. There's also, Leanne, I think just some things we might want to pick up through the LCJP here. Mm -hmm. Because also, obviously, it's not just the police around charges and, just, and all the rest of it. It's the DPS and mm, yes. their response to mm -hmm. it as well. And I do just wonder whether there's something we might want to pick up through that. Yeah. channel as well. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Can do. yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll pass it over then. So uh, who's, who's, who needs this next? So John, this is John's new look report. She's really good. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so um, we've uh, worked to present our performance in, in a different method this way, um, so this is the first time we've presented it this way, um, and I would be really keen to take feedback on how we might improve it. I'll take on board Will's point from earlier about how we might fit some staffing profile in here with diversity, etc. Uh, but any other comments would be very welcome um, from both panel and the public. So, um, So this is the uh, this is covering the month of April 2019, and what this um, table here shows is that the total number of incidents we had in uh, April 19 um, was 603, compared to 545 in the month before of March. Um, the types of incidents um, are set out in the tables on the top left and right there. So. Um, majority of the incidents that we've had um, were in the uh, automatic fire alarm, uh, sorry, false alarm category. And false alarms are broken down into a number of different categories. So they can be uh, automatic fire alarms. There could be uh, a number of them there which are fires in the open, which people have seen. And they could, could just be general um, domestic smoke alarms going off, or it could be that uh, people have seen things and perceived it to have been uh, an incident that it wasn't. Um, 
The other large category that we've had uh, uh, within that number are uh, actual fires, and I'll cover a little bit more about that later. There's different types of fire that we've had. And then the other types have been um, special service calls, which cover things like um, rescues, uh, and that can be from vehicles, from machinery, uh, and it could also be um, rescues from people within um, you know, different, different uh, things that they get themselves into. Um, separating it down into district areas, so this is the um, bottom right hand table there, it shows that our busiest district is still uh, York, uh, and York, when I say York, that um, covers um, Huntington, Acom and um, York Central Fire Station, and they are uh, the busiest stations um, still, and then of course, following on from there, Scarborough, and then Harrogate, um, and you'll notice there, um, following on from that, it then drops down to Hamilton. Hamilton seems slightly higher than you might expect. At the, the very bottom right corner, fires in Hamilton seem higher than you'd expect. It's been uh, a busy, busy month for, for Hamilton, and uh, we've yes, yes, got the uh, group manager. Yeah, it's just, it's just it, it has been a lot of, uh, um, we had that dry patch, uh, and we did uh, end up uh, uh, going to a number of small field, more scrubland fires, uh, and that sort of boosted the numbers. Right. But uh, the good, good spot. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it isn't, um, you know, the weather. Um, it's interesting you see it. So I would have thought that would be reflected in Richmondshire, Craven, yeah. and other places, but not yeah. clearly not. Just seem to be the edge of the laws this time. You know, you just can't. It's one of those things you can't predict. Yeah. It just just went that way. Yeah. So the other thing that's notable on that is the proportion of false alarms in York in comparison to other areas. Yes. And is is that presumably because you? I mean, obviously, you do quite a lot of prevention work. So, so my question is, is, is that, you know, is there a difference in the way that that is done in York, or is it because you've got a different, it's a city and you've got a different set of Yeah, there is, there is a profile within yeah. York is that there are, you know, obviously a lot of conurbation there. There's a, a lot of, um, well, there's like hospitals, university, yeah. and they tend to be the highest dial of the vendor, if you like, shall we right. say, on automatic fire alarms. Um, similarly, Harrogate uh, and Scarborough have sim you know, less, but uh, it's still the, the larger proportion of work in those areas. Whereas you drop down to some of the uh, uh, smaller districts, um, and the automatic fire alarms and fire of false alarms tend to drop off somewhat. So presumably, then you do more work in York and Scarborough on trying to deal with those types of issues. Yeah. Yeah, so when we come on to talk about our prevention activities and more so pro protection activities, um, the staff there would be very much focused on, we have a protocol in place whereby um, if we reach a certain trigger point of numbers at a particular yeah. premises, then we'll send our protection staff yeah. in there and, and they would go and do specific work to try and mitigate that uh, for the future, yeah. Uh, we, we, we brought in a, um, an automatic fire alarm policy a few years ago now, which then um, adjusts the attendance according to the day or night, but that tends to be on, on the sleeping risk. So wherever we, wherever we have um, sleeping accommodation, then that's where we make sure that we uh, do that's that. Right. Or something like yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the, the left-hand uh, table there just sort of shows the times of day that we actually get our calls. Uh, and interestingly there, um, from, from the hours of um, midnight through to about 8 o'clock in the morning, it tends to be the quieter period, and then through the day up to about 10 o'clock at night is where well, we tend to be busier with incident types. So this slide here shows um, a breakdown of the three uh, fire categories that we've been predominantly looking at here. So primary fires, and these are where fires are generally more serious um, that can harm people or cause damage to property, whereas secondary fires are generally small fires outdoors, not involving people and not involving property in general. Um, and it's very much a 50-50 split. The other category in there, of course, is chimney fires. Um, very small amount of chimney fires, but nonetheless we've had 12 within 
the, uh, the month of April. Um, but then secondary and primary have been uh, sort of even split. And when you look at the uh, secondary fires, sorry, um, yeah, the secondary fires there, they tend to be, again, weather related. Um, this time of year we get um, uh, moorland being uh, burnt for cow shooting and such, so that can cause us a problem at times. Um, wildfires in general can cause fires, especially if you have a dry month, um, or dry parts of the year, they will tend to increase. And just what does heat sources brought together deliberately? <laughs> Um, that can be a number of uh, things, so that could be, um, you know, um, c cigarettes, it could be um, um, yeah, more, more than malicious style. Right, that's what I'm wondering, uh, like arsons. Yes, yes. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. Um, so that's quite, that's quite significant. Is that is. an anomaly, or is that a, tr a trend that you see? Well, we are we are identifying for this month particularly first first time identifying it, it, yeah, reporting in this way. But we are uh, we are conscious that um, malicious style fires and deliberate fires particularly are are increasing both in the county and and across the region and nationally as well as it's a trend that we are identifying. And this is where we need to sort of try to find the root causes of some of these things. Uh, John, does it other mean you don't know, or it's not recorded very well? Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, or is it is everything else that yeah? That there are code. some which um, you know uh, don't don't warrant um, full investigation. It could be a whole, a whole range of uh, different bits which fall into the other category. I don't know if you like to elaborate on that one. I think I think it's the recording one. system. To be honest with yeah. you, it's a bit clunky. Uh, it's the we use the national recording tool, the incident reporting system, uh, and and it's a little bit clunky around the edges, and some things fall between the categories. And there's also the point when, when the if they have been investigated by uh, a fire investigation officer, they may say it could be this, but I can't rule out that, and it ends up dropping into this other category. So, so this heat sorry to go back to the heat sources brought together mm. deliberately, but do you investigate all of those then? It would depend on what the what the nature of the incident, how severe it's been, uh, right. and such as that. So whilst it's in the primary fire, it may be that we got there, we got dealt with it extremely quickly, and it was it, and it was um, low. Uh, it would just all depend on the circumstances because obviously we don't investigate absolutely every incident every time, we, um, you know, to the full depths as we would do if it's caused severe damage. Um, it, it would it would depend on the amount of scale of the damage and what's actually been involved. All, all our incident command, all our incident commanders are trained as uh, as level one fire investigators. Then we have our specialist team who are level two and level three, uh, and they're mobilised depending on the incident type. Uh, but can be requested onto any incident. So something a, a rubbish fire will always be will more often than not be, be just being investigated by the uh, officer in charge of the appliance. Once it becomes more serious or, or it's spread, there's more serious damage. That's when the fire investigators come in. Okay, because obviously there's a discussion around this going on mm -hmm. that um, you don't actually have to investigate fires. It's not part of your statutory remit. Um, and um, there is a discussion going on around the police's role and the credit because of the accreditation demands that are coming yes. down the track. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. and the expense of all of that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 if we're seeing heat sources brought together deliberately <laughs> <laughs> increasing across the country and at the same time a, a, a concern around the increasing costs of forensics accreditation and the fire service potentially withdrawing from fire investigation that raises some really quite significant questions yeah. which is probably not for this board to answer but it's mm. probably something for me to take to yeah. Roy when I next see him yeah. mm. right any more information that you've got on that trend would be really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, we will certainly have a look and um, do some um, comparisons on previous months as well. Uh, but certainly, certainly yeah. we can monitor that. Yeah, that'd be really on interesting. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Captain, yeah. what's the difference between you investigating something and a finding of fact versus a police finding of arson? 
We tend to work hand in hand, to be honest with you, with the with the yeah. um, Because I think. Yeah, but, and I think the point is that our CSIs need the expertise yes. in the fire service to yeah. prove the cause of the fire, because they're not accredited in fire investigation. So. One's leading to us, and we tend to we tend to set, that's where our FIs are trained yeah. to a certain national standard. Come in, work with the SOCOs, and tend to say, "I need a photograph of that, take a sample yeah. of this," and then we reply, we construct the report, which may be an expert witness report for court uh, that's then used. Because our CSIs are not expert witnesses in the fire. Sure. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily follow that something that has been categorised there is yeah. arson. Is that yeah. right? So those, out of those 30, some, some, some will be, but not necessarily 30 yeah. arson. Yeah. 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 Well, I presume that some of those you wouldn't be able to prove who did it in the first place. That's many of them, um, yeah, proving who uh, is, is a different thing altogether, you know. Yeah. Proving who is not is that yeah, where it comes to the police role, not how the fire started in a certain way. Can so you record some of that having an individual? Yeah. yeah. So, Tom, can we just plan yeah. this one? Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next table comes on to our uh, appliance availability overview. Um, so at the top left, you will see. Um, a red, a yellow, a green, and a blue. And what that is, is our fire cover model, um, which shows um, we've got 46 fire appliances in total, uh, and the desire would always be to have 46 available where possible, but um, within there, we've got resilience built in, because obviously we get incidents, we get simultaneous incidents, we've got um, appliances that need to go and do training, and we accept that um, due to the on-call issues that were previously discussed many times, um, appliances may, may have to be off the road because of insufficient crewing. Um, but this, the, the table on the left-hand side there shows how we fare. So we've got a, a model which is 46 appliances would be the blue, that is the maximum available, and then the optimum ranges between 38 to 45 and then the minimum is between 32, 37, and then if it goes between, the drops below 32, that's then into the critical area. I'm pleased to say that um, the majority of the time is within the optimum. Um, however, there were two days there on the 16th and the 18th of April where we did actually fall into the critical category uh, for, for a period of time. I mean, this hides the amount of work it takes you to get to a green yes. state, doesn't it? It does. This is the actual yeah. availability. Um, yeah, absolutely true. We've got uh, an operational staffing reserve, which we move staff uh, around on, a, on a, a regular basis, and certainly on a daily basis, and sometimes on an hourly basis, to, to cover gaps and shortfalls because the fire goes up, uh, accruing, uh, goes up and down throughout the day. Um, so we, we're constantly moving people around for various reasons. Can I just say, so so when I first got involved with the fire and rescue service, trying to get hold of this information was like hen's teeth, it seemed like that, didn't it? And there was all sorts of accusations of cloak and dagger and hiding the information. It is so great just to see it out there in a really simple chart. So great, fantastic. Massive improvement in transparency. <laughs> you might come on to this anyway, John, but I can't. I'm going to steal your thunder and say how <laughs> brilliant it is to see some of those fire lean halls and Bentham and all those places turning out. Yeah. 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 It's unbelievable community yeah. sort of service there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and true, uh, what's not in here is the strength beneath there of some of the, the retain stations. Um, I'll sing the praises of Reef, for example, yeah. who have extremely low crew numbers and yet commit themselves yeah. hugely to almost 100% availability. Mm. Uh, fantastic commitment and that's just a real demonstration of um, the work that the, uh, the on-call stations particularly do. Um, but it also is testament to why we need our whole time staff as well because also you know they are the resilience <coughs> in the background where you know taught there and moving people around on a, on a frequent basis it's the whole time staff that help support that as well as so on both sides work very hard on it. Is there work um, ongoing in, in, is that Summerbridge? 
Yes. So Summer Bridge, um, you know, that is one of the ones we've got a, a real issue with at the moment. Um, but again, you know, with, with the staff that they've got there, they do very, very well. Uh, they are operating with, uh, with five staff at the moment. Um, so, you know, the, to say that we've got some uh, availability issues, and yeah, we, we recognise it. Um, but, um, so if anybody is watching, <laughs> in some of it's yeah. I think yeah. it's important to mention employer support as well. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. 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 So the overall availability was 88%. Um, the on-call uh, availability average, uh, 83% um, compared to 84%, so it's comparable with the previous month. And nationally, that's, um, for the on-call side of things, nationally, that's, uh, that is very good. Uh, some stations, some services are down in sort of 56, 50, 60% for on call. So we're, we're, we're pleased with that figure, but there's also improvement. Is this reality tested? So you know on paper, you've got right, we've got enough people to call out and it's on paper. So I know when we have our national responsibility for the border support, it gets tested every so now and so on paper, it looks like we've got enough people to send if we got called. And we do sometimes reality test it on tabletop. So we'll put a call out there at and see if we really could get those people out. Do you ever reality test it? Uh, it'd be difficult to do that because in order to do that, you would have to press the alert button and they would have to come into the And that's station. basically what we do. Yeah. We, we basically tell people there's a call out and we see how many of them turn out. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something we don't do uh, because of the disruption it may well cause to brand employment and other yeah. things within there. You know, it's something that uh, we, we rely on um, What's on paper is on right. Paper has yeah. been right and, but people, uh, you know, people, people do say, don't they? But like on an hourly basis, I am available. I am not available. Yeah. So they yeah. they're not they they really do, don't they? Yeah, um, very rarely. Uh, I suppose the acid test for this one is very rarely do we get a situation where we do press the button and we can't, can't turn it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, yeah. when that does happen, we class it as what we call a failure to respond and investigate that. But that doesn't. So that's your that reality testing. That's the reality yeah. test. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time, John. Okay. Uh, yeah. Going through. So here, um, the next slide is um, our prevention and protection activities. Um, and uh, the left hand column so shows how many home fire safety checks, stroke safety well visits we've undertaken. The blue is the. Um, community safety staff that have undertaken that and then the um, orange colour is the station staff that have undertaken that. And the similar applies on the right hand side there in terms of fire safety audits. A um, few points to note, Harrogate on the uh, um, home fire risk checks is none for the, well one for the blue and that's because they've got a vacancy there from the community safety officer. Um, the balance between the two here is that um, we carry out themes for, we just introduce for our business safety uh, a theme for a quarterly basis and the theme at the moment is um, multi housing and multi multiple occupancy. So the focus is to go out and do um, fire safety audits on that type of category of building. Um, we will also do the other work as and when we get complaints or if we get an incident, etc. Where we've got a district which don't have that ma that quantity of buildings to go and um, audit, then we would expect to see more in the work of the prevention, uh, the safety and well, etc. So I've got one question on this, John. Yeah. On your self-referrals, so you've got 51 self-referrals after, after your visits. How do we know if people are actually referring themselves into services and are receiving support? No, that's referrals for safety and well visits. Oh, so referrals for, for yes. yeah. ah, yeah. apologies. So I've misunderstood that. So that's the referral mechanism into the safe and yes. well, rather yes. than the outcome from it. Yes. Do yes. we measure then the outcomes from it? Um, it's a question I will have to, ha um, I will have to ask. If we've got a repeat, uh, repeat um, visits to go back, then we will be able to monitor that one. Sometimes we don't have. Uh, follow-up visits, um, but it's a, it's a question I shall ask, and um, it's not something we actively monitor to, to ensure, because sometimes um, we have to have consent from individuals to refer on, um, 
but the follow-up, um, whether actually what this goes on with other agencies <coughs> is, is often pretty difficult for us to track. So I, I understand that, but there's a step before that, and that is when 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 a member of staff goes into a home, yeah. do they record the advice that they've given to that individual, and uh, and actually if you like, the immediate outcome of that, as opposed to the secondary outcome, if you see. Yes. So, so, so w when we go into a home, we would record the advice that we exactly. provided, yes. Right, OK. I just, I just think that, that that's a whole area that could get quite interesting, isn't it? But I don't think, so at the moment, I don't think it's collated in the same yeah. way with some of the other police things. It's, you'd have to look at each individual yeah. sheet, I believe, to at the moment, yeah. Yeah. and to actually understand where they've been referred to. This is where you need a mobile app. Yeah. I'm sure there are some mobile apps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, okay, all right, that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah. All right, we are going to have to, you're yeah. going to have to whiz yeah, through these ones. Uh, so I mean, John, do you, if there's anything, can I just suggest that if there's anything in there that you think we really need to know, we've got the paperwork. Yeah. If there's anything that you think that we really need to know. No, I don't. I don't think there is. Other than um, on the on the accident ones, there. No, that's fairly typical. There is a type. There is an error on the April accidents on duty. That should actually read nine, not eleven, because two of the accidents were off duty. Um, apologies for the correction there. The next slide, uh, again, um, this one um, shows our sickness, but again, that. One thing I would say is some of the stations you will see quite a spike on. Um, unfortunately, we've had a number of people who have had some nasty accidents, um, and that often attributes to that skews figures. Um, and, and, um, and similarly, we've got some people who've got um, yeah, yeah. personal issues there. So, uh, and then the final one is. Uh, not the final one, but the next one on. Yeah, it just sort of shows the uh, the FOI's subject access, access request complex and compliments. Um, that's sort of fairly fairly constant what, of what we would expect throughout the year. Um, no real spikes on that one at all. <laughs> and fairly low numbers compared to You should have just seen what we were days. looking at earlier this morning, yeah. John. <laughs> you know, you were there. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> <laughs> just for a week. Yeah, that's, that's in a month. Uh, so it's, it's fairly low numbers. Yeah. And then finally, the safeguarding referrals. Uh, this is where um, we do refer on uh, and make referrals into safeguarding and uh, other. I, I don't think you'll be able to answer this question, John, but maybe for further consideration at another point in time. Hamilton obviously sticks out on the referrals to fire set of programmes as somewhere you wouldn't necessarily to be <laughs> as high as that, three times as many as Harrogate, for example, and on the <coughs> on rural referral referrals from NYFRS to others. Again, it just is a sort of, it's, you know, you wouldn't expect York and Hamilton to be quite the same or or Scarborough and Harrogate to be so far apart. Just some interesting questions in amongst that. But uh, just with the Harrogate, there is the, there's no CSO in Harrogate at the moment, so they just so that's probably why the figures are down there. Uh, and it, <coughs> uh, it depends on what if the if the uh, it depends on what's picked up by the type the, the the fire type if the if the people are identified, and also the fact that it depends on what program the CSOs and the station are running at that time. If that identifies people, then they're put into the system. So we may get a number come through all at once. I think it's worth um, the Hamilton one there, the fire sectors. That's um, not quite. I'll go back to the uh, the initial one where it was a busy month for Hamilton. Um, you can see we may well have corresponded yeah. there if we've had, um, you know, yeah. with, with, um, without looking at the causes. Yeah. yeah. On that it's over a long period. That's that's. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. We do. We need yeah. To. Great, fantastic. Real good progress, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Kieran. Is it Kieran? Yeah. I want to go up top speed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> the custody <laughs> went on 15 <laughs> minutes longer. So. <laughs> Talk less about one three six admissions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you'll see, uh, which I think is slide slide four um, just picks up uh, no, no arrest for 136 this month uh, which is or no detentions rather uh, which, is, which is good news for us um, just picking up a little bit of the sorry well sorry, done. can i just um, i'd like not to ask this next month i haven't had my chat with 
It's going to be admirable. Who knew that? <laughs> anyone, <laughs> anyone. I'd just like to go through the process about um, the review that you do on detentions yeah. uh, for section 136 because I know it's still brilliantly low, but yeah. there are still more than. Maybe so, this is like when people are in custody and it ends up as a 136. We'll review in every single case and we'll just let you know. Yeah, the ones that become 136. Yeah. Yeah, we're we actually keeping an eye on all those. I know, so I've, I've, the agreement was I'd look through some case studies with you and understand the process. Happily. Yeah, I'll fit that up. Yeah. 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 I'd be an efficient middleman there. And just the point on the, on the next slide, we'll see we've, we've continued with the normal practice in relation to ambulance transport and has gone back to, to where we are, sort of 50 50, um, uh, which, which is good news. Um, and again, we, we talked a little bit last month and we, we'd agreed that we'll do some work in the background in relation to detainees going out of force to other areas. Um, and the irony is that the two last, the, 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 the couple last month, um, it actually took our officers last time but mm -hmm. to be dealt with up at Middlesbrough than it did for them to go for local swings. That was going to be my question. So that, I didn't know if it was a typo or it is. No, I'll be right. Yeah. Um, the, the, the suite at uh, James Cook is, is large. Um, and it can take multiple occupants and um, they've been engaged with Cleveland doing it this way for quite a number of years so there's as much as it pains me to say it talk about <laughs> something on the side doing well but as slick as slick can be at that particular yeah. site well they've got a hub haven't they yeah, 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 got, uh, yeah, yeah. so really was in 24 yeah. hour function backed up by effective yeah. and embedded street triage and the, 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 the um, mental health professional in the control room so that's one area I think where yeah. um, Tube have got it right it's a different tube, of course, to the tube that we've had to anyway. Yes. Even though it's tube. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think they've brought it together now, haven't they? But in, in name. So hopefully we'll see an improvement and the building works change mm. in the yeah. suites. But uh, we, we, are, we are concerned about the capacity of the suites within the North Yorkshire yeah. area moving forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Durham particularly might be a challenge in the area. Yeah, the Durham yeah for, for the, yeah, the Darlington Memorial there, they are quite slow. So they're slower than we would have if we took them up there, but if we take to Middlesbrough yeah. to get a really good service. Yeah. Okay. All roads lead to Middlesbrough then. <laughs> I do hope not. <laughs> so um, so uh, mo move it, moving on, if I may, uh, uh, you request we inserted an additional slide for this month just to give you sort of forced level of crime incidents rather than having the three, the three geographies. So we've got that slide there, which just gives you an overview of where we are force wide. Um, you'll still see that our, our sort of most most busy areas are sort of in New York and Scarborough, as, as you might expect, um, and then the other parts of Scarborough and York, York and Selby tend to be the, the, the higher hitters in terms of volume of crime offences, as, as we would expect from, from our broad demand. Um, and then acknowledging the time, if I skip over the three local areas. of crime across the force area um, by, by crime type um, and you, you'll see again in sort of uh, violence and property offences are the biggest ones for us and, and again picking up some of the commentary over the last couple of meetings what I've done is I've, I've turned that into a geographical slide. Oh ten. thank you. Uh, <laughs> tried my best. Um, <laughs> Obviously, open to some discussion in terms of the types of crimes that you might like to see. But what I've what I've done is I've picked out sort of the top six volume type crimes and, and, and sort of tried to balance that up against the ones where there are some community concerns. So naturally, we've had some discussion about burglary, and I rightly will we, we can bring some more detail to the next panel if that makes sense for, from the head of crime to yeah. give us a bit more information around investigations. So the headlines for us, we, we know it's, it's increasing in certain parts of the force area. We've, we've, you can see some of the areas that there's big percentage increases, but we're looking at really low numbers, so it's quite susceptible to that. Um, York uh, have, York and Selby, they've got in place a, a burglary coordinator now because they've seen, seen an increase, um, as, as is noted in the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the figures there. Um, on last year, so locally over the last quarter, we are starting to see some control coming back on Burberry, New York, and Selby. And excuse me, the new senior leadership team at Harrogate, um, Craven, and the rest of the county command 
they've uh, borrowed that with pride and put a, a burglary coordination there as a, as a six month trial so we're hoping that that will help us bring together some of the offenders because then one of the things we had identified because of the geography and the disparate nature of the offending plus the people who come from other force areas one of the things that hits us is we can't necessarily police a geography to try and tackle it we've got to look to police offenders mm -hmm. and look to piece together and tie together methods of operation time of offenses types of property stolen um, means of attack um, and doing that when you've got it going across different CID teams is, is, is a bit of a tough task so we're going to, we've got this coordinator coming in to try and help this, this coordinator function coming in to try and assist us with, with, with improving the picture there so I'm hoping to see some improvement across the next couple of months. So do we, do we know why Rich Pembleton and Richmond Shire are the um, uh, exception well, in a good way? Um, <laughs> I think probably the, the the, the likeliest of the likeliest of the event is that we are less susceptible to travel and burglars. That's what I was yeah, coming in the yeah, top of the yeah. side and the yeah. bottom of the bottom of Darlington yeah. than yeah. the other parts of the force are. Yeah. They tend to go for if, if they are coming across for criminality, there's some drugs activity, but then there's also um, the, the types of um, what you call the sort of thefts from from other premises that that wouldn't constitute a burglary in terms of farm and similar. So we see a little bit more of that. And, and to the credit of the, the Hamilton and the, the Richmond Royal Task Force, they're really getting on top of that uh, as, best, as best as we might expect. Which leads me to the wider question, which is what the question we did have cross border crime previously, but I just do <coughs> wonder what the real extent of cross border crime is in North Yorkshire at the moment. Because we, we weren't able to quantify that, and we've, and I, and, and I am, you know, we've got really big crime increases in our neighbour, some of our neighbouring forces. <coughs> and we are easy pickings. What Fee Willie had, who presented that, was the information, I can't recall what the percentages were, of offenders that are based out of it. Yeah, area. so you so get that's some custody stats. But that's there. not the same. Yeah, where they live, yeah. Same with the no. You produce stats from stock charts, etc. ANPR, custody. I know, I just wonder whether that is really worth really looking at. Because it, it, it looks, you know, if that, it, you know, we've always known it's a problem, but I, you know, it would have, that analysis would affect how you do things, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, the yeah. tasking approaches that we adopt do take into account the, the, the type of offending that we get coming across the border. Um, we've got better relationships with Durham and Cleveland, I think, in terms of intelligence and information sharing plus yeah. the work that we do sort of physically with them in terms yeah. of joint border operations yeah. than we have, say, with West on the south. Across that side and yeah. south. Because yeah. the other thing to say about burglary in Hamilton Richmondshire is, is it has reduced. So you'd imagine either to criminals being locked up or dissuaded from coming to North Yorkshire or they're doing something proactively that's different that has reduced it. Well, I think that there's elements of that, but I think also, particularly, the f this is where I get my own back on Cleveland, isn't it? The, 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 the other side of the, the coin is Cleveland is really, really struggling with its reactive demand. So some of the burglars who are local to that might think, well, there's no point in travelling yeah. because I can, I can commit my offending on the local patch and have less likelihood of being caught. They've, they've had some difficulties in terms of their, their ability to resource certain things. And we haven't been in that position, which is fortunate. But, um, it, 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 it's quite a complex landscape, mm -hmm. I think, isn't it, in terms of both the cross border plus the, 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 the methods that are and, and it's also about priorities in neighbouring forces as well, yes. isn't it? Because if you talk, so if you talk to representatives of the NFU, they will say there are very different priorities when they go out and yeah. engage with South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, and North Yorkshire. They will find far more of a focus on these types of th crimes in North Yorkshire than they will in West and yeah. South because they've got different different priorities. And, and, and if we know that, that's an additional risk for us that, you know, as much is as seem to be having an impact. It does, and, uh, and as much as we, we try and encourage our neighbouring forces to gather and provide information and intelligence, if their if they're crime priorities aren't focused on their local burglars and things, we don't find the information out because it's not readily, mm -hmm. it's, well, not readily available, it's not available at all. So it can be a bit of an uphill struggle with But, 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 but it, with information, we can challenge, can't we? And at the moment, I don't. I mean, I would like to be able to go to Mark Burns Williamson and say, "Mark, have a look at this." And there will be intelligence packages you that know, exist, and conversations yeah. we're having with those forces. Yeah. 
and we're particularly doing them in relation to county lines all the time. Yes, so absolutely. Yeah. That's that, the obvious that, one. That type of criminality yeah. and, and sort of yeah. threat to vulnerable, yeah. vulnerable yeah. people are doing that all yeah. the time. Um, but in terms of the, the, the property crime, acquisitive crime, the other forces may help. Probably, probably. And also, we, we do suspect in the rural areas that a lot of the property and acquisitive crime is organised. It might not yeah. necessarily be serious, yeah, yeah. but it is very definitely organised. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's serious by virtue of the scale. Well, precisely. I mean, you're looking at this, and this is looks pretty serious to me. Yes. But you know, yeah. It is still a very safe place to live. Just yes. The, you know, yes. Everybody. Yes. But yeah, put these stats up for some of our surrounding forces. Yes. And yeah. In, and we talked about context yeah. earlier, didn't we? About yeah. when we do a lot of performance stats, it's also about ensuring we've got the context of where we sit in the wider picture. And, and North Yorkshire, a bit like John said, with. Um, on call firefighters again that there isn't quite as much to do when when you live somewhere very safe and then burglary doubles albeit the numbers are low but the community feel that yeah, yeah. double doubling Absolutely. however wherever it rested to start with yeah. doubling feels quite seriously and so, yeah. much is a big impact, it? so yeah. we know we know that there's work to do out towards the west of the county and um, steve thomas has just gone over there has, has, has started that um, he's been there three or four weeks so it's really it's, it's, it's a work in progress and hopefully we'll see some progress very soon on the flip side though we've got good news on asb and actually that's interesting because i would certainly say that the, the the people that we get coming to talk to us used to come and talk to us a lot about asb and they're now not doing so and they're coming yeah. talking to us about drugs and burglaries <laughs> so so you, 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 it, it, and it is you can see we can see it in the feedback <laughs> that, that we get. The compliment about asb <laughs> it is a, well it yeah, is a compliment it, we say it every month asb goes down and down down yeah and down. it's really good yeah, yeah. i think the the I, I met the, the new the, the, the new new arriving PCSO on uh, last Thursday, start with us next Monday, so the first cohort for you and you know yeah. greater numbers. Um, and, and certainly when you look around the local areas, the, the, the way that they're embedded inside community, the intelligence flows, yeah. all that. Yeah. And there's something about us trying to replicate some of that work yeah. across to the acquisitive crime yeah. and pick up, you know, yeah. who's dealing drugs, yeah. who's who's stealing yeah. things, where the where the you know where the receiving houses are and things. So we, we, we've got we've got some thinking to do, but the thinking's already started. So hopefully we can provide you with a better update in terms of that application next month. So, um, um, so that was taking us to ASB. Um, we've got there's, there's nothing uh, particularly that I wanted to talk to in relation to um, proactive policing. If that's okay. Um, rural task force as ever. Uh, been busy. We've done a number of checkpoint operations with um, our local and neighbouring forces, and we've had some success there in terms of uh, making arrests and, and, and so on. So that's that's been been good to see, um, and I think that has helped us in terms of just making that border hostile, which Fee had talked about. Fee William had talked about with a number of times ago, and that seems to be the key for us: is the more hostile we can make the border, and the less porous it is, yeah. the more successful yeah. likely to have in relation to our travelling criminals. More work as ever to be done there. Um, you, might, you might also start to benefit the sort of seemingly much more interactive WhatsApp groups and intelligence mm. in that way that may, may have just yeah, never yeah. arrived with yourselves before. Yeah, just getting that free flow of information across, isn't it? Um, and, and that's that's where we're, we're hoping that we'll, we'll start. And I'd say it's, it's rolling out across a couple of areas with a, a few teething problems to ensure the standards are met sure. and so on, but we'll be getting there. Um, and then I think the, it's the control room next. Um, um, Continued pressure in relation to speed of answer um, for both uh, Travel 9 and uh, 101 calls. So it'll be interesting to see the, the outcome of the, the output from the decision of the central government to make 101 free. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it'll make much difference. No, I don't think overall. I think what yeah. we might see is we might see some more calls displaced from Travel 9s into yeah. 101. Because you have to pay for them. And, and yeah. that, that'll be one for us to, to, to manage and monitor, I think. Um, so uh, we, we've got we're, we're out of the, the consultation period and into the transition now in relation to the change in shift patterns and um, demand modelling around uh, <coughs> contact management and dispatch in the force control room. Um, that has gone from a from an organisation and a staff perspective. I think it's gone as smoothly as it could. I think it's it's been, it's been very positively received by the staff and by Unison. Um, we we will look to go live with the new patterns um, mid August. Um, and then that'll that'll be the that'll be the catalyst to some different ways of working in terms of our ability to be more flexible with the deployment of resource to make us better able to answer questions more quickly. Um, 
I think in terms of consistency, when you look, it's consistently been under 10 seconds for the answer for yeah. many months now in comparison if you went back 12 months, some of the, the challenges that we had. And I, I spent a bit of time with a colleague from another course in the South, uh, and I was describing some of our performance, and uh, she was envious, to say the least, uh, in, in terms of uh, the court waiting. So I think, I think set against the national picture, we're in a, we're in a relatively good place. Um, but that shouldn't leave us in a position of complacency because the standard that's expected yeah. love it's not about where we are nationally it's about what the local population expect of us so yeah but it, it shows the work everyone's put in has been yeah. and to be fair the police and crime panel they did acknowledge that uh, that this had um you know s significantly improved at the last meeting so that was good it's interesting i don't know if there's been any talk nationally but decrease in volume for that i don't think we've seen a decrease in volume year on year for me no, it fluctuates, doesn't it? No. If you look at the figures, we, we have some quiet oh, numbers, do, do but it okay. still goes up again. Probably an unexpectedly quiet month in, in April, based on where we were for the first couple mm. of months yeah. of the, the first few months of the year. Um, but we're, we're gearing ourselves up for what will be the busiest yeah. summer because year on year it's, it's, it's creeping up. It goes up, up. Yeah. It's the busy uh, summer. Yeah, it yeah, will be, and, and we'll, be in the, we'll be in the midst as well of the shift pattern. The, the shift change over in August because that was the only time to do it appropriately set against um, the, the, the way that, that everything else balances out structurally. So we've got plans in place to make sure that we provide a resilient service to our August, September as we do the change through. But importantly, when we talk about some of the other crime pieces which we don't necessarily report upon, that will also put, push us into a position where we're better managing the administrative demand in the back office in the control room. So our patrolling officers should be in a better place to respond more effectively. So hopefully this will really start to sort of grease the wheels for us organisation. So, so there's, there's a, a, I'm on the um, National Digital Public Contact Programme Board and um, it's the results of Single Online Home and some of the social media work that's going on in that programme are really starting to be really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and I know we're a ways off with it, but in terms of looking at our future planning for demand in the control room, we will have quite a lot of data coming out of, the, out of that programme, yeah. which I think will be quite helpful for us. Yeah. Um, this, this, the, the social media work that is going on is really impressive, um, and um, the um, officer, well, the person who's leading that, from Staffordshire originally and he's now on the national programme. So he'd come and do a presentation to us and I think it'd be really interesting. I mean the data set that they've got behind it is seriously interesting and impressive. Um, and actually um, I think that some of the rationalisation processes that, that, that they've got there around things like Twitter and all of those mm -hmm. of it will be really, really interesting for us. Really interesting. slide for us is just the um, it's a little bit of a rejig of the, of the crime picture from earlier against um, some of the, the, the locally agreed priorities uh, uh, and you can <coughs> see it's, it, it, it's relatively it, it's a relatively good picture in certain parts of the force but, but not so good in others and we'll talk about that I think in, in relation to particularly Craven uh, and how it's <coughs> working going yeah. okay great alright thank you very much. Um, anybody got anything else? Have we got any Twitter questions? No. No. Okay. All right. Anything? Any other business? No. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So we are over. We're going to have to. Well, next month is mental health and it's a joint presentation. Okay, all right, so that's your help. Boundaries. So yeah. it's one long presentation, so we'll get time to get into detail. If, if, if that's not the case, really. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> Thank you very much.